Wednesday, Indiana Congressman Dan Burke chaired a meeting of the House Government Reform Oversight Committee to discuss the ongoing investigation of campaign fundraising. At issue during the session was the chairman's authority to depose witnesses during the committee's upcoming hearings. The meeting lasts about five hours. Quorum being president, the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. Today we have some important business to attend to, which will help the committee uncover the truth about the allegations of campaign finance improprieties, serious national security threats, and possible violations of law. We will consider adding two new rules to our committee rules which will govern the manner in which domestic and foreign discovery using conventional devices such as written interrogatories and depositions will be received or taken. Before I begin my opening statement, I ask unanimous consent that all members of the committee be permitted to include their full statements in the record. Without objection, it will be so ordered. I recognize myself for as much time as I may consume. The Government Reform and Oversight Committee meets today to pass new rules in anticipation of the committee receiving certain investigative tools from the Public House so that it may proceed with its investigation into campaign-related corruption and national security threats. Among other things, this committee is investigating reports of improper political fundraising, misuse of official resources, alleged interference and obstruction of ongoing government investigations, and other potential illegal acts which fall within the committee's jurisdiction. Americans are naturally alarmed when they learn that our national elections may have been compromised by hostile foreign elements. The American model of democracy has its foundations anchored in liberty, freedom, free election, and the rule of law. It is up to this committee and the Congress to determine whether there was any attempt to undermine our democratic system. At its core, our investigation is about the possible abuse of power and authority by those trusted to safeguard our national security. It is about public and political party officials failing to safeguard our most valued democratic principles and traditions by allowing foreign, criminal, and corrupt individuals and entities to influence America's free elections, the very means relied upon to preserve our system of democratic self-government. We may be investigating the largest systematic and coordinated effort to funnel illegal funds into our national elections. It is high time we found out whether the fundamental integrity of our government has been abused, exploited, compromised, or jeopardized. The American people have the right to know whether our system of free and fair elections, revered throughout the world, was infiltrated by hostile foreign sources. Did the communist Chinese government or individuals associated with the People's Republic of China attempt to influence the 1996 presidential election? Was the Democrat National Committee a willing participant in laundered foreign money, or was it merely grossly negligent in taking millions of illegal campaign contributions from foreign elements? Was the United States national security compromised or endangered in any way by John Wong, who apparently had access to top-secret briefings and information before and after he became a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce and then Vice Chairman of Finance at the Democratic National Committee? Did the President's friends, acquaintances, and benefactors work to secure former Associate Attorney General Webster Hubble's, Hubble's silence by providing him lucrative consulting jobs, including a $100,000 or more payment from the Lippo Group, the huge Indonesian conglomerate and employer of John Wong? Did the Immigration and Naturalization Service radically change its naturalization policy in order to boost Democrat voter rolls, even though many were convicted felons? Did White House officials use government funds for political purposes when it spent over a million dollars on the White House database? 
Why have so many of the subjects of this investigation take the Fifth Amendment or fled the country, even though the American people have been told that no wrongs have been committed? of national policy and national security abound as daily re revelations disclose more troubling facts about the unusual access that questionable individuals had with high-ranking White House and administration officials in private meetings, fundraising coffees, and other political events and official functions. According to one published report, the FBI has obtained substantial evidence that top Chinese officials approved plans in 1995 to influence with American politicians, and that the scheme continued through the 1996 elections. Testifying before the Senate subcommittee in March 1997, FBI director that the FBI task force investigating the fundraising matter would scrutinize as one of its top priorities whether there was a direct threat to our national security by a foreign government to influence our political process. Free told the subcommittee, and I quote, one of the subjects that the task force is going to be investigating are allegations with respect to not just illegal political activities and contributions, but also the national security aspects of that and whether the funding or attempted funding or planning was originated not by individuals per se, but by a foreign government or state sponsor or ministry. Quote. The White has recently admitted that President Clinton ordered then Chief of Staff Mac Party personally to investigate the Department of Energy's support for political contributor Rob Roger Tamraz's proposal to build an oil pop line, pipeline through the Caucasus after Tamraz spoke with the President at the White House on March 27, 1996. Tamraz, who is reportedly wanted for questioning in connection with a possible embezzlement charge, contributed at least $177,000 to the DNC and affiliated state parties in 1995 and 1996. Although Tamrez's access to the White House was opposed by White House National Security Council staff, they were overruled by senior White House officials who allowed Tamrez to visit the White House on at least six or seven separate occasions in 1995 and 1996. Related matter, the Department of Justice and the CIA Inspector General are investigating former DNC Chairman Don Fowler's contact with the Central Intelligence Agency, Robert Tamraz. In the Tamraz case, it is alleged that Fowler asked the CIA to vouch for Tamraz to circumvent the objections of Nancy Solderberg. In another case reported by the press, unfavorable information obtained by staff on the National Security Council about a potential White House visitor, California businessman Yogesh Gandhi, prevented him from meeting the President at the White House. However, quote, Democratic fundraisers arranged for the meeting to take place on May 13, 1996 at the Sheraton Carlton Hotel, two blocks from the White House, where Gandhi met with President Clinton and donated $325,000 to the Democrat National Committee, end quote. These are just a number of the disturbing revelations that surface daily and raise serious concerns about how national security or policy may have been compromised by such questionable campaign donors with unique access to the White House. In order to fully investigate these and other important issues, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee requires the ability to engage in the discovery process both here and abroad. You should know that nothing in the resolution before you is unprecedented. All of the investigative tools contained in the resolution have been utilized by Democrats in preceding Congresses. In major wide-ranging congressional investigations such as this, Congress has historically provided deposition authority to facilitate the fact-finding process. You may recall that the chairman of various investigative committees were authorized by House resolutions to subpoena witnesses to take part in staff depositions in the Nixon impeachment proceedings the assassinations investigation, Korea Gate, Iran Contra, and October Surprise. In fact, the Council of the Iran Contra and October Surprise Committees were empowered to issue deposition notices. I can assure this committee that I will remain accountable and won't delegate such, such authority to staff. Staff depositions are an integral part of our effort to uncover the truth. The committee has received thousands of pages of documents and has begun to piece together the intricate web of potential fundraising illegalities. 
The committee is at a point where it requires sworn testimony, which will be taken in execution of those with knowledge schemes to funnel conduit payments to politicians and national party organizations. Because of the potential political and criminal implications and ramifications, you have voluntarily come forward with our inquiry. The committee must be able to obtain the testimony of those who would not be inclined to volunteer it. Also, there have been numerous inconsistencies between witnesses on a number of key matters. Providing a format of sworn deposition testimony allows the committee to best evaluate the veracity of a various witness and clarify the events in question. Because of the wide-ranging and ever-expanding scandal, we may need to depose literally hundreds of witnesses. Needless to say, it is impractical and unrealistic to expect that members will be able to be present in time-consuming deposition preparations as well as the depositions themselves. The Whitewater Association conducted 271 depositions, which took approximately 1,200 hours. The Travelgate Investigation conducted 80 depositions, which took approximately 271 hours. These two investigations combined are not as wide-ranging as this current investigation. It is a long and arduous process which has been used in numerous House investigations to uncover the facts. The deposition authority contained in the resolution will assist the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight in obtaining sworn testimony quickly and confidentially without the need for lengthy and unproductive hearings. The minority is also asked by the proposed rules. I will consult with the minority member at least three days three days in advance of noticing a deposition, and I will make sure that all members know three days in advance that a deposition is scheduled. Such a provision was never etched in the rules of either Iran-Contra or the October committees. It will afford the minority and witnesses ample time to prepare for the deposition. I intend to have extensive coordination with the minority the deposition process moves forward. Similar to the authority to conduct depositions, the committee is seeking the authority to engage, through official government channels, extraterritorial discovery. Because we think much of the evidence we need may be in countries like Indonesia, China, Thailand, Thailand and other countries, the committee requires the authority to seek out testimonial evidence from persons or entities in countries. This is usually done through judicial and international devices known as letters rogatory. The Iran Contra and October Surprise Committees were granted these authorities, and various other special investigative committees use some or all of these international discovery de devices. Members of this committee should understand that this is serious business we are about. By adopting these rules, and later this week, the adoption of the House resolution will move this investigation forward so that we learn the truth in the continuing allegation of campaign finance improprieties and possible violations of law. And I ask members to support these new rules. I now recognize my colleague from California, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Chairman, from the beginning of this investigation, the minority has been willing to work with you in a bipartisan way to aggressively investigate campaign funding abuses in the 1996 election. Every opportunity the majority of this committee has said, no thanks. As a result, the minority only receives 25 percent of the committee's budget. The chairman has insisted on issuing subpoenas unilaterally. I think 156 at the last count, developing a $40,000 case and then denying the access to it. And the majority has precedent by not even notifying the minority of interviews with material witnesses. Notwithstanding these partisan acts, the minority offered to support you, Mr. Chairman, in obtaining deposition authority, so long as you followed the precedent of this committee and the Congress. And again, you said no. No precedent for what you are demanding today. It's an outrageous and partisan grab for power, and it delegates all of this power to the chairman. And he, in turn, can delegate it to his staff. That has never been done before, and it should never be done. This issue of 
relationship, I think, is an important one because this investigation should not be partisan. The points the chairman raised about the American people's right to know if there was a systematic intention to funnel illegal contributions into these campaigns is an absolute a valid point. The American people do have a right to know how to be getting this information out to them, whether it's from Democratic abuses or Republican abuses. And yet we've seen a, an investigation that's only targeted at Democrats. And one might ask why this is the case. Three years ago, Newt said that if the Republicans won control of the House, they would aggressively use subpoena power. And he predicted that, quote, Washington just can't imagine a world in which Republicans have Sabina power. Last year, the Republican leadership sent a memo to all committees instructing them to focus their activities on investigating the Clinton administration. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. This committee deposed 72 people for over 240 hours of questioning in the travel office investigation. And last week, Speaker Gingrich told CNN that he was personally overseeing this committee's investigation. Well, look, let's look at what we're investigating. To date, the chairman has issued 282 subpoenas or requests from informa for information from Democratic sources. He issued only 10 subpoenas or requests for information from Republicans. The chairman has obtained 320,000 pages of documents from Democratic sources, and he's complained about those sources having, having been uh, sufficiently cooperative. On the other hand, in contrast, the chairman has obtained 15 pages of documents from Republican sources, and upon receiving them, issued a press release praising the cooperation he had been given. Imagine what would be happening if we had discovered that John Fowler, the former of the Democratic National Committee, had personally solicited foreign contributions, arranged to launder the contribution, forced a foreign contributor to default on a loan, and was described as being, quote, fascinated with foreign money. Can you imagine the that would bring on the majority side? And can you imagine the number of subpoenas that would have been if such a uh, factual situation had been brought to light? But when it's Haley Barber and not Don Fowler in that situation, we only hear silence. Mr. Chairman, we're spending millions of dollars in an investigation that has already lost all credibility. The majority has a last chance to put this right on track. We're going to be offering amendments to have us follow the deposition authority rules that have been the precedent of this committee. Even though depositions have rarely been used, they've been used with a check system built into it. And I would hope the committee would follow those precedents. We're going to have an amendment offered by uh, Mr. Kanjorski, which will have us uh, uh, provide at least a minimum of fairness and bipartisanship. We hope the Republican members of the committee will support us so that we could try to bring this investigation to what it ought to be, a fair, bipartisan investigation, not one that is unfair, partisan, and wasteful of the taxpayers' dollars. And we have uh, charts up on the side if uh, members may want to make reference to them. Yield back to the I, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to entertain any more openings. Submit your statements for the record, uh, if you like. I now call up the. Do we have accepting opening statements from anybody? Why aren't we having opening statements? I, 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 I stand corrected, Henry. We will, uh, we will entertain opening statements, Mr. Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I, I thank the ranking member for his opening.
I think he is exactly right in setting the standard for this committee. We ought to follow precedents. The precedent of this committee, the precedent of the House of Representatives. The uh, ranking member began by mentioning that he gets 25% uh, share of the total budget. That is not in keeping with precedent committee because when he was in the majority he accorded us in the minority a smaller percentage but we are happy to give you a larger one the matter before us today is very straightforward as the committee and other committees of the house and so many times before we are once again granting authority for depositions it is obvious but it bears repeating that this is the same authority many congressional investigative committees have routinely sought and received from Watergate to Whitewater, from Iran-Contra to October Surprise, Congress has voted to give members and staff deposition authority, period. None of this is unprecedented or unusual. And while the authority this committee is seeking is similar to what previous Congresses have accorded to similar investigative committees, in some cases it is more narrow. Proposed Rule 20 establishes a similar to that granted to at least 11 other committees in recent history. In fact, Congress has granted staff deposition authority so often that to call it anything but routine would be disingenuous. It is also important to note that the majority and majority staffs have met and discussed these proposed rules, and the majority's views have been taken into full account proposed rules. Proposed Rule 20 is, narrow, is more narrow than previous authorities because it contains safeguards that were not included during previous Congresses. These include three days' notice before any deposition is taken. All minority and majority members, not just the minority member, will receive notice of all scheduled depositions. There were no safeguards for either the Iran-Contra investigation or the October Surprise investigation. In other respects, the proposed rule is the same as the deposition authority Congress has approved over and over again for the last 25 years. I recall uh, as a member of the minority in 1991 and 1992, the minority agreed to the majority's request for the same staff deposition authority that we're approving today in connection with the October surprise investigation. In fact, uh, the minority agreed to staff deposition authority, letters rogatory, and depositions. All of this because we want to get to the bottom of the charges that President George Bush personally flew to meet Ayatollah Khomeini and beg him not to raise our hostages. These uh, we viewed as untrue charges, but it is precisely because we wish to get to the bottom of them that we wanted ample authority to be granted to get the truth out, and that's our job today. It's vitally important that we recognize that nothing in the rules that we are agreeing to today bears upon how the investigation will proceed. That's something upon which we must cooperate uh, every day as we go forward. The important thing for us to observe today is that the procedures that we're establishing are the identical procedures that this has adopted in the past and that the minority in the past has granted to the majority willingly. I yield back and I thank the chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Wise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm sure the debate will hold. I think it's going to be evident that this is not established precedent. I have a list from the position authority in the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight Going back to the 92nd Congress, as I recall, you and I were the Congress, and in no situation during that Congress was there such unprecedented authority uh, this uh, this committee chair. Only in the 104th Congress, when the Republican Party took over, uh, did that authority begin. And even then, the that was less re ranging in scope than what is proposed today. Certainly is the case with unilateral subpoenas for depositions. That means one person, the chairman, being able to, to issue a subpoena for a deposition and to bring somebody before uh, the committee staff and members for a deposition. I have some concerns as well.
charts, if I could get our charts back. I, I think that it's important to note that uh, in the issuance of unilateral deposition subpoenas, once again, the chairman being on his own, in effect, able to issue a subpoena for a deposition. If you're talking about the Senate campaign finance investigation, uh, no unilateral deposition subpoenas could be issued. House travel, Senate Whitewater, House arms to Bosnia, Senate P MIA investigation, House October surprise investigation, there were no unilateral subpoenas issued. Uh, joint Iran Contra, Judge Hastings impeachment, Judge Nick impeachment, Senate Carter Libya investigation, House assassination. Some of these investigations go so far back, nobody in the room can remember them or probably participated in them. The point is no unilateral deposition subpoena. Uh, uh, subpoenas were issued. Only in this investigation. My concern, and we're the debate, Mr. Chairman, is a concern I raised the first day that we got into this. I want us to be looking into every aspect where the American people need to know, and we need to know as members of Congress, where something wrong took place during the 96 election. I happen to believe that the 96 election, in the case of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, was a nucle nuclear meltdown. It, it, everything, all the fail-safe mechanisms stopped, and indeed there was a, a total excess of money poured it, both possibly illegal and certainly cases uh, in violation of the spirit of the law. Now, having, it's only credible if we all join in this together. You have a long list of what you want to, this committee to investigate that all dealt with the White House, and we're with you. I think that we ought to be investigating that as well. But I, I noticed some things that weren't mentioned. I noticed that Haley Barber's name, chairman of the Republican National Committee, never was mentioned. And yet there have been significant public allegations about coming into the Republican ranks. I notice there were no mentions of members of Congress in their fundraising practices, many of which have been published. I don't notice subpoenas going out in regard And yet we would, say, we would say that it was all on one side and not the other. We all know, and the American people know, that is not the case. This side, the Democratic side, this side, the Republican side, ought to be investigating this. The problem is we're only going to investigate one side of it, and we're doing I believe that the credibility of this entire process is totally, totally besmirched. We will not be able to issue that credible investigation. When I look and I see the pages of documents received so far by this committee, by you, Mr. Chairman, 3,000 pages from Democratic targets of investigation. That's fine if there need to be. If there are that many documents out there and they're important, so be it. So that there have only been 50 from Republican targets. I find it interesting that on the basis of soft money, that number ought to be reversed since the Republican Party raised more money than the, Rep than the Democratic Party. And so the, the issue isn't who raised the most money. The issue is where do the problems lie, and we should be following the trail regardless of whose party is Republican or Democrat. Let's go over to subpoenas and document requests issued so far in this investigation. According to our charts, 282 are issued by you, Mr. Chairman, on, on Democratic now looking at Republican targets to number 10. Surely, once again, we'll be doing a little better than that. Surely, in order to be a fair investigation, all sides ought to be involved. And so we want to work with you. I don't want to sit for day, for hours, weeks and months, on this, only to have, at the end of the day, a process that nobody takes seriously. If we're going to spend this much time, Mr. Chairman, we all want to work with you. We want to make it an investigation that the American people can look at and say all of them, Republicans and Democrats alike, delivered a product that was worthy of their effort and our consideration that we all take faith in. We want to work with you, Mr. Chairman, but it, it makes it very, very tough when we have this kind of treatment. And so I meet with you again in the interest of making sure this is a credible investigation for all concerned and so all of us can take and the American people can take very seriously. I would to change your mind into a truly fair process and work with us in making these rules same as we have been able to conduct a number of other investigations a number of other investigations in a fair manner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Wise. Uh, Mr. Micah? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to respond uh, first to the ranking member's comment about uh, budget authority and uh, the majority giving the minority percent of the uh, budget for this uh, committee. When I first came on this committee, I took to the floor of the House of Representatives to protest 
distribution of investigative staff. As a freshman, uh, just uh, four short years plus a few months ago, uh, this committee provided five in investigative staff to, to 55 uh, for the uh, then uh, majority. I think we've been more than uh, fair in both the handling of this uh, hearing, uh, these issues, and the investigative uh, staff. Now, why, why do we need uh, this authority? Uh, and you've heard it's unprecedented. In fact, it, it isn't unprecedented. If you look at the authority granted for the Iran uh, contra investigation under Rule 7.1, the authority is almost identical. What's unprecedented is and uh, in, in the history of this committee, or my work on this committee, is that the individuals involved uh, have either pled the Fifth Amendment in uh, astounding numbers or fled the country. This is the problem, uh, I submit, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, where are these witnesses? They fled the country. We've got one in Georgia, and I'm not talking about the Speaker's District. Uh, we've got Charlie Tree, we've got Pauline Kanchak in Thailand, we have Riyadis in uh, Indonesia, we have Ted Sutter in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, these folks have fled the country. And if you look at the vast majority of subpoenas we've issued, the information we need is from bank accounts and from individuals uh, who have fled the country or have uh, the Fifth Amendment. Now, we, were through, we went through this last time with the other side, and Mr. Klinger was more than fair, and we are asking for a little bit more authority. The same authority I, in Iran, Contra, an international investigation, no more. The difference we found last time, they drugged their feet, they tried to blur the issues, played the process. If this was a, uh, a judicial You'd be accused of obstruction of justice uh, in, in this kind of, uh, or that kind of a proceeding. But, ladies and gentlemen, we still don't even know uh, who hired Craig Livingston. I managed to drag that out. The gentleman tell me in what way we might a be accused of justice. Personnel files. The gentleman we yield. I, I have limited time. What we make we, we still don't know I mean, the time. full details of drug abuse uh, and security breaches at the White House. All those investigations blurred and delayed tactics of the other side. Now, we have national security concerns. We have, we have issues that, uh, and we aren't a proceeding. We're an investigatory proceeding. But it's the responsibility of this Congress to get to the facts. We need these tools, the same tools, to get to the facts to get to the information, to get to the witnesses who have fled the country. This is an unprecedented uh, scandal in the history of this republic, in the history of the democratic uh, elections process of this country, and we can't blur the issue. This, they're trying to compare Clyde-type crimes to traffic violations, and it's not going to work in this kind of process. It the process and the thing that that really makes this process in my opinion uh, the, the great part of this institution is in fact that we do investigate ourselves we uncover wrongdoings and then the process we try to make legislative changes so that this doesn't happen again and the uh, these changes keep us from becoming a republic so what this is about that the subpoena authority is about people who've fled the country, people who've taken the and and trying to uh, subvert the process. And I resent what's being done on the other side. And the difference, the other, with the, with the investigations that took place in the past is you had an administration that cooperated, Ronald Reagan cooperated, and you had a, a Republican side, a minority side that cooperated. Instead, they're trying to obstruct, they're trying to obscure their trying to uh, delay and ruin the process that's so important to this uh, this republic and and keeping a system uh, in so I thank you and yield back the balance of my time chairman yields back the balance.
The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kajorski. Mr. Chairman, I've sat here and listened to uh, the discussion on both sides of the aisle. And I have to call my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. It's a terrible way to start off what both should be a bipartisan effort. Uh, it seems to me the issues that will come before this committee involve elections, fundraising, probably cutting as close and quick to politicians we all are, possibly get. So I think we first have to set the uh, standard that there are going to be lost tempers, there are going to be people that feel they're getting, get, being taken advantage of on both sides as we proceed through this hearing. But Mr. Chairman, today you have a unique opportunity. And that opportunity is to proceed back on course from where we left that course several months ago. As you and I know, and the American public know, that you've been subjected to a great deal of editorial criticism in the methodologies used here at the committee and apparently the targets to be investigated by this committee. It has gone to the extent that some writers recognized in America have said that the contamination is so point that any product produced by this committee in its final report will be meaningless and so partisan and so colored as to contribute nothing to the political system. We all have taken a, a pledge to hold and have used to exercise the authority we exercise today. This is how we got here, gentlemen. I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, that in examining these rules and the amendment you step back one moment and ask yourself the question, how our amendment, in which we think would establish fairer rules, have any curtailing effect on the authority of the committee? We're going to do certain things. We're going to ask to go back to the rules that this committee has always followed in the past, and your immediate predecessor, Mr. Klinger, falls in the 104th Congress. Rather than unilaterally issuing a subpoena, uh, exercise the concurrence of the ranking member, and if the ranking member doesn't concur after three days' notice, that a vote of the committee, which clearly you have a on your side, has, and then that subpoena will issue. No problem. It just gives us the opportunity on the issuance of subpoena, the ability sometimes to avoid meaningless hurt aggravation, annoyance, and tremendous invasion of privacy and unusual expense to individuals will ma which may not be necessary. I think that's reasonable. I think if you step a step and realize that all we're talking about here is something the majority of this can do at will by a majority, but not exercise unilaterally by one member of the Congress. As a matter of fact, I think that will go to the benefit of the by nature of the, uh, uh, of the committee's desire to care. Secondly, we're going to ask that a deposition, that there be balance when examination is made, that the majority side, council or staff have one hour, and then the minority have one hour. And then if there's additional questions, we go back to the majority for one hour, and the minority follows for one hour. That's the precedent of the House of Representatives. There's no problem in the House that the Speaker designate is undesignated a rule from the Rules Committee that uh, the Chairman of uh, the majority has 10 hours to speak, and then after the 10 hours, the minority has their time to speak. It's been done that way, but clearly, in the process of a quasi judicial process where we are seeking truth advantage, to have one side do examination and then the other side offer examination because, after all, it does allow us to target in on supposed true facts that we're trying to elicit from the witnesses. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would like to just say this. The exercise of opinion power is contained in the Constitution Article of Congress of the United States is the most intrusive exercise of 
sovereign power in this country. The fact that the should have that power, I think, is right and good. Whether that power should be exercised by a single committee of the Congress has been passed upon and allowed. Never to my knowledge has that power been delegated to one single individual of the Congress of the United States. I would say to stay down that road and that precedent is extremely dangerous for the democratic process all here to defend, particularly in light of the fact that concurrence of the ranking member or a majority vote of the party in this committee delude your authority to issue subpoenas, to give us equal time and examination of taking depositions does not in any way compromise the majority's position or strengthen this matter. There is going to come a time if committee that the majority will have to turn to the majority, or to the minority, and require concurrence and vote to issue immunity. I do not believe if the majority runs down the path of unfairness and lack of respect for minority rights, you can reasonably expect strong cooperation when that happens. And as some have said, all successful committees have had to immunize witnesses, understandably so. We can issue you the authority, Mr. Chairman, to command the presence of an American, but we cannot in issue you authority to circumvent the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. The only way we can that testimony individual witness is to exercise the authority of immunity that the Congress has on the statute. So I would suggest if we look for fairness and we want to get on with a understanding of what happened in the election immediately past and who were the responsible, let us do it for the beginning and equity today. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Barr of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Fairness and equity, I think those were the last words of the gentleman on the other side, yet they follow what I think is a discussion on his part of the words that we've heard today, and that is raw, brutal threats. The raw threats on the other side were that unless we buckle and succumb to the wishes of the other side, they will attempt to thwart on behalf of the American public to immunize witnesses in order to obtain testimony that the American people need. Make no mistake, Mr. Chairman game that is being played on the other side. It has nothing to do with fairness. It has nothing to do with precedent. It has to do with raw, brutal, partisan threats and exercise of power. And I don't think that the American people will stand for that. I appreciate the gentleman on the other side and making people exactly what they care. The we're here on the far left which lists investigative tools is fact. It is a fact, Mr. Chairman, that the Iran-Contra investigation, the October Surprise investigation, the Travelgate investigation, the Whitewater investigation, all provided the Chairman was authorized to subpoena deponents in order to take depositions upon consultation with the ranking minority member. That is really and only the power, Mr. Chairman, that is being sought today. It is fully in keeping with the prior investigations. Moreover, Mr. Chairman, it is entirely in keeping with the need to conduct a wide-ranging investigation, which has been made necessary by a number of things that have happened over the past several months, including witnesses leaving the jurisdiction of this country in order to secret themselves and make themselves unavailable in countries as far ranging both geographically in terms of their civil procedures as communist China. The only way that we will have any hope at all of getting to the bottom of some of these questions with regard to witnesses because of the dilatory the other side and the in the White House have made Thus far, unavailable 
reach of the people of this country seeking answers. In the process now, as in any legal type proceeding, to obtain deposition authority in order to pin witnesses down, which is the only way that any member, whether they're on the minority or majority side, or on the plaintiff or defendant side, or on the prosecutorial or defense side, and other proceedings that are similar some respects to what we're doing here and pin witnesses down, place them under oath, ask questions and either in court or in the situs here, the, uh, the committee proceedings, the hearings, you can, uh, if you don't have that sort of benchmark information, chairman, that can only be gotten by placing witnesses under oath and asking them questions, then you are absolutely at the mercy of the witnesses and what the other side wants. We have seen in the uh, efforts, very successful on the part of uh, administration witnesses that come up here, they know the rules, they string things out, uh, and unless we have the ability, Mr. Chairman, to pin witnesses down, which other prior investigations controlled by the current minority then in the majority have had, we will not be able to get the answers that the American people demand. Also, uh, here, Mr. Chairman, about eight very large loose-leaf notebooks. These large, loose-leaf notebooks contain news accounts. They, they contain various news accounts from various news from the Washington Post to the L.A. Times and everything in between with regard to the allegations that have given rise to the matter that brings us here today. In other words, the rising out of an allegation surrounding the 1996 election cycle. If we adhere to the philosophy on the other side that for a subpoena to a Republican group must issue one to a Democrat, vice versa. Otherwise, proceedings are somehow flawed or partisan. I suppose, and I would hope then that the people on the other side, the Washington Post and the LA Times and all of the other newspapers, can say, you must write one article against a Republican every time you write one against a Democrat. Otherwise, your paper is flawed. You are being bipartisan. You are being unfair. Well, Mr. Chairman, the real world doesn't work that way. Well, as a former prosecutor, I say thank goodness it doesn't, because if we adhere to the procedures and the philosophy purported to be put forward by the other side today, we would never be able to put together any case against a drug trafficker, a corrupt politician, a collar crime artist, because they would be able, the defense attorneys, and that's essentially what the side are playing today, is defense attorney tactics to string things out, to throw to talk about issues that are extraneous, and as the work in the courtroom in the search for truth, Mr. Chairman, we must not allow those tactics to work because our mission is the same as the mission in a court of law, and that is to get at the truth, and we must be able to utilize the rules provided to us under the Constitution, under the laws of this land, under the rules of civil procedure, similarly in court situation, and under the rules that have been utilized by prior Congresses, Mr. Chairman. We must move forward with this if the American people are to have the answers that I believe, and I know that uh, most of our colleagues believe essential. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back to bounce. Uh, the gentleman from California. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I want to deal for moments with a historical precedent in terms of an investigation by a subcommittee of this committee. As you know, <clears throat> In 1989-1990, as chairman of the Employment and Housing Subcommittee of this committee, I chaired the investigation of what came to be commonly referred to as the HUD scandal. This is, by general agreement, one of the most partisan, successful, and credible investigations of recent years. It resulted in more convictions other congressional investigation in recent memory. Sixteen convictions, including the former Secretary of the Interior, James Watt. The subcommittee uncovered widespread abuses, influence peddling, blatant favoritism, monumental waste and mismanagement at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. This waste, abuse, and mismanagement cost the American taxpayer in excess of billions of dollars. For a period of 14 and 27 years, 
50 witnesses appeared before our subcommittee, requiring more than 120 hours of testimony from May 1989 until July 1990. 50 witnesses appeared before the subcommittee. Six witnesses were subpoenaed by a vote of the members of the subcommittee, among them former Secretary Sam Piers and Debbie Dean. Six witnesses, including HUD Secretary, invoked their amendment rights against discrimination. Thousands of individuals were interviewed by subcommittee staff without deposition authority. In the HUD investigation, Mr. Chairman, individuals were contacted and told they could come in voluntarily to answer questions or face a panel of members of at a full hearing. In almost all cases, the choice was easy. Individuals came in voluntarily and met us and answered questions. We had no deposition authority, primarily because we were concerned about its chilling effect on our investigation. This approach resulted in one of the most respected, partisan, and successful congressional investigations we have seen in recent years. The last time our committee met on campaign finance, was <clears throat> we met to debate your authority to unilaterally issue subpoenas. The majority voted to give you this unprecedented authority against my advice that it would tarnish the credibility of this investigation. My point then was that an investigation needs to be bipartisan in order for it to be credible in the eyes of the American people. My view certainly has not changed. In order to be bipartisan, an investigation must first be fair to all of the members of this committee and be fair to all of the individuals who are before our committee. Minority rights must be protected. Issues of due process must be protected. There must be procedures in place which will permit the full participation of all members of the subcommittee, including minority members. All members of the committee must have a fair opportunity to question witnesses. There must be no secret means of the investigation which excludes Democratic members. The rights and duties of Democratic members of Congress should not be less than that. As a matter of fact, as I read also, I find four classes of people. The first class of people are the Republican members. The second class of people are Republican staff. The third class are Democratic members. And the fourth class are Democratic staff members. I don't think this is a very attractive procedure to the American people. Your proposal before us today eviscerates the rights, responsibilities, and duties of all the members of this committee. It delegates our investigative duties to staff. It elevates staff above elected members of Congress. The proposal would deny, substitute a full investigation and people to hear and see. In its place, we will have a gold, secret, closed, arbitrary backroom, star chamber. The question we are considering today is whether this committee should grant the chair unprecedented power to unilaterally issue subpoenas to compel a witness to attend a deposition without the concurrence of members of this committee. Unilateral deposition authority is unprecedented, unfair, unnecessary, and in my judgment, unconstitutional. I yield back the balance. Gentlemen, yields back this time. Uh, the Indiana, Mr. McIntosh. Chairman, uh, I support for this resolution. Deposition authority is necessary to stop the White House, frankly, from attempting to cover up the possible misuse of official resources for campaign-related activities. Uh, for example, you mentioned in your opening statement about Mr. Tamarez, only through depositions will we be able to learn why the DNC trustee and oil pipeline financier was, who was wanted by Interpol, as you pointed out, was actually allowed access to the White House. National Security Council's recommendation that he be excluded. Now, ignoring his advice, the White House welcomed Mr. Tamarez at least times for coffees, receptions, and holidays. <coughs> Our
our subcommittee investigation of the White House Office database <coughs> found out that he even attended a, quote, personal private dinner and a movie at the White House last June, an event that the White House initially refused on the grounds that individuals who attended that event were only close personal friends of the President and the First Lady. Clearly, this is not the case in at least this one situation. We cannot get satisfactory answers to our questions about potential misuse of government property for political purposes without this deposition authority. Depositions are the only to completely uncover the White House misuse of the office of presidency in exchange for contributions. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisles to join in a bipartisan approval of deposition authority so that we can get all of the facts and then speak for themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Fatah down as Mr. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, before I begin, I would like to ask you a question, if I might. Uh, ask for a brief response. Uh, a little bit of part of, of, of the remarks, but I'm just kind of curious about something. In your opening remarks, you referred to China believe as a, quote, style foreign source. I think those were the words that you used. Now, I happen to personally be against most favored nation status with China. I'm going to vote against it, concerned about the lack of civil liberties in China, concerned about a trade deficit. But as I'm sure you have the leadership of the Republican President Clinton, as well as many people in the Democratic Party, support F MFN with China. Corporate America is investing tens of billions of dollars in China. It's a real. How did, does the United States Congress or do you, China is a quote, foreign source? How did you come to that conclusion? I may briefly ask you that out of curiosity. I, I think that's a matter of uh, 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 just. I, I, I did not uh, make that uh, comment. Uh, Standpoint that I thought they were going to, uh, there was an imminent attack uh, on the horizon. Uh, but I do feel like many of the activities of the Chinese government uh, uh, border on hostile, particularly if it has been alleged to influence the uh, foreign policy of the United States and our uh, that very hostile act on. Uh, 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 analogous to a military attack if a foreign government yeah. foreign government if I might just finish sure. if a foreign government tries to influence or change our foreign policy by uh, using illegal campaign funds a political campaign I think it's uh, almost as dangerous as an attack on us from a military standpoint Mr. So do, from that standpoint Mr. Yeah. Chairman one time Paul Without all with you on that issue, I, I, I was curious about your use, given the fact that the leadership of your party, president, and many contribute large sums of money to Congress are actively fighting for most favored trade status with China, and that status already exists. So I happen to be concerned about what goes on in China. I was just curious about you. But let me get on to the thrust of the and that is... Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I, in my view, the whole campaign process is an outrage. Uh, it is no secret uh, that corporate America as well as other people investing millions of dollars into the political process. And I would hope, Mr. Chairman, at some point, you might want to have a meeting. Why is uh, how do we change a campaign finance system which is from one end of this country to another, which clearly favors uh, the wealthy and the powerful who have enormous influence over the political process? So we might want, to, might want to pay some attention uh, to the overall process. Second of all, uh, I would have to agree with many of the members of the side who have that the credibility of this investment this meeting uh, is hampered when you make the suggestion that the only people uh, culpable, the only people committed 
who have done things wrong are Democrats. I don't think there's anybody in America uh, who believes that. Uh, Chairman, uh, press reports, I, I noticed Mr. Barr before was talking about the press. Well, let me inform him that there were press reports in the Boston Globe, Congressional Quarterly, the Washington Post, New York Times, indicating that uh, former Republican Chairman Harbor personally solicited, solicited $2.2 dollars and loan guarantees from a businessman believed arranged for the point six million of the loan proceeds to the Republican National Committee arranged for the additional last minute transferred from the RNC sixty targeted house only pressure to the business absorbing uh, NPF on the loan. Not to mention that there are Republican members of Congress who are there are allegations against as well. So if we going to do an investigation the horrendous campaign finance situation in America, let's do it. Let's tell people that we are sick and tired of money buying elections. We are very concerned what happened with the White House, with the Democrats. We're concerned what's happening with the Republican Party as well. And let's go forward in a nonpartisan manner. After all of this is brought up, finally the United States Congress will do the right thing and real campaign finance reform for all, we can take big money out of the political process and give the democratic process back to the American people rather than to the wealthy and the powerful. And if we can do that, Mr. Chairman, we will have really served people very well. And I think we're appreciative and gratified by the work that we're doing. But if all of this amounts to is an effort to say, well, gee, just the Democrats are terrible and evil and just the White House have committed, possibly committed uh, uh, activity, but the Republicans, they're above it. They're, they're wonderful folks. They never would thing, and we're not going to let them at all, then I think the process is going to make American people believe and think what in fact it is, that it's highly partisan active and regarded as such. And I balance of my time. Gentleman yields back time. Before I yield to Mr. one real brief comment, or two brief comments. Uh, first of all, uh, in addition to what I said about uh, China being a hostile nation, there are a couple of other reasons why I, I in my statement, uh, they are selling weapons of mass destruction to countries like Iran, that is a known terrorist state. For those who believe in democracy and human rights, I think most would agree that that's a hostile act. We also have about 10 million people in communist gulags that are products that were. Mr. Used. Chairman, if I could no, you, you, You're out of time, and, and, uh, but let me just say that. Uh, State General, State is point. My, we're in the middle of going back and forth, giving each member a chance. I mean, if the chairman wants to make another opening statement, we'd like the chance to make another opening statement as well. Respond to some of the things that have been said that are grossly unfair. And uh, I, I understand you want to elaborate on why you think uh, China is uh, an offense. And I'll stipulate that, that, that point of lack order. of human rights in China, but my point of order is. Other members have been seeking the first opportunity to speak at this hearing, and I think that ought to be recognized before any member, including the chairman, gets a second. Uh, uh, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, uh, the chairman has had the ability to comment during uh, uh, the five minute rule, but because I want to show some comedy, uh, I'll defer my remarks till later. Mr. Horn. And Mr. Horn, if you, uh, if you happen to have a minute at the end, I'd like to uh, ask for you to deal. Uh, I thank the chairman. The chairman knows that when I walked, I didn't want to make an statement, and this is not an opening statement. I want anybody that wants to make an opening statement, just make them to your heart's content, and then let's get to this and deal with the issues that confront the investigation. Uh, but I just, having listened to a number of the on the other side, I'm going to get into this little debate. I'm delighted Mr. Lamb his subcommittee numerous times, both in my subcommittee in the record and in the full committee in the record. It's a model of bipartisan cooperation. What made it a model of bipartisan cooperation was the gentleman from Mr. Shays, who was the ranking member. The investigation happened before I came. Congress, but as I've said repeatedly, that was a model investigation. And there's no reason 
be a model investigation if the minority in the room now will the gentleman uh, we've got limited I'm delighted to let the gentleman yield uh, in a few minutes when I finish my points. The fact is, as I say, Mr. Chase made that a model investigation because if the minority in the committee now, Mr. Shays did, vigorously into questioning administration appointees as we, we have an obligation to question those that the press has uncovered have violated many laws of this country. So let me hit another point, consultation. Being a university president for 18 years, I'm well aware of the phrase consultation. Consultation does not mean that Calhoun has been reincar reincarnated and that consultation means a veto. It is not a veto. It is consultation that when you have subpoenas to be issued, you notify the ranking minority member a certain number of days. If the ranking minority member chooses not to respond, that's still consultation. That's up to the ranking minority member. Any you know would welcome constructive comments from a ranking minority member. And I just think the record would be very clear that when you get a number of possible witnesses, many of whom have taken the fifth, many of whom have fled the country, and are somewhere in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, you name it. They're everywhere but within the jurisdiction of a subpoena in the United States of America. They ran. They fled. Now, if we can find some of these people who are willing to talk under immunity or whatever, the fact is members of the committee and members of the cannot be missing here and running all around the world. And the staff can, and the staff should. When we get down to the nitty let's be realistic and not talk about members trying to track Mr. Tree and the others. I suggested the other day on the floor of the House, maybe we should see if the Chinese have milk bottles and put Mr. Tree's picture on it and maybe get a little help. Notice in the terrorists that killed two people at the CIA, that's exactly what funded in Pakistan. Now, I don't know if that was out of presidential slush fund or whatever, or a discretionary slush fund. I wish the executive branch would help us find some people roaming around Asia to get away from the jurisdiction of the Congress and the courts of the United States. So, that's all I have to well, say. Well, the gentleman point. Uh, to be glad to yield to the gentleman. I, I thank you for yielding to me. I don't want you to be under the misunderstanding that the minority objects to taking the deposition of these uh, characters that we've been reading about who may well have been involved in uh, the campaign finance system. We would support subpoenas. We would support the deposition of those individuals. And more. A situation where someone were to be in flight, we would also support giving the emergency authority to issue a subpoena. What we object to is that the, the pre precedents that have always been followed where the minority is consulted and uh, concurs, and usually that's what happens, or to the members to make the final decision is being taken away from us. We feel we're being disenfranchised from this investigation. When uh, witnesses are being interviewed and being misled, Minority is not willing to be there. We were willing to be there. We request subpoena. When the investigation becomes more and more partisan, we feel we're being disenfranchised. And that's a, 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 the, the problem that I see, because if we're being disenfranchised, the scope of the investigation is being narrowed to Democrats only. That's a signal that here is clearly a partisan investigation for partisan purposes by Republicans. Democrats, rather than Democrats and Republicans working together to find abuses wherever they may come from, whether it be a Democrat or Republican involved. Well, if I might reclaim my thing, uh, let me just say, the gentleman, as I said earlier, would do what the gentleman from Connecticut did, work of the majority. The gentleman from Connecticut was in the minority, 
but he didn't go around protecting misdeeds of the Reagan administration around to get at the truth. I just hope the gentleman from California on this committee would want to get at the truth and not say a group of people that every effort is made in the executive branch to either get them to free the country, to have lawyers in the room where they can later claim lawyer privilege, all the ways to stiff us through. Some of us aren't more. We had to go through file gate, travel gate, you name it, when records weren't given, records were denied, justice was obstructed. That's, if you want to stop and not have it, act like the gentleman from Connecticut did when he we, we, we accept that challenge, the truth, and I must say, gentlemen, we even called for an independent investigator Regular so that we order. could get the truth. time has expired. Mr. Fatah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, many of my colleagues on this side of the uh, aisle of uh, fairness uh, is, uh, you know, it's kind of um, against the reality of what we have in front of us. In no derogatory way, but given the past history and comments of uh, the chairman the and other members on that, is a absolute belief that the Clinton administration is guilty of something. And if we just have enough investigations, eventually we'll find something that we can pin them on. And we've been through this for four or five years now. Uh, and we've heard the litany, file gate, travel gate, on and on and on, we spent tens of millions of dollars unable to funky yet, but if we're trying, I guess there's a belief we can get at it and do subpoenas and traveling around the world looking for these and those who have abused the process, um, maybe we'll get, we'll be successful. Now on the front page, we have a story about dead people contributing to Republican campaigns, but we can't focus in on what might be right in front of us. We've seen the story of uh, legitimately uh, um, where Time Magazine and others have brought out foreign contributions to the party, but we don't want to investigate that. And I think that this is what appears to be almost hatred of Bill Clinton is going to, you know, at some point, destroy those who are uh, those who are the uh, the attackers because your credibility on these issues is damaged, to say the least. It's almost as if, rather than looking for wrongdoing, what is an election of the democratic process. It was an election in '92. Bill Clinton won. Rather than allow him to proceed forward. The administration has been mired down in these investigations. Not one has been proven yet. Now there's been another election. The president was reelected. Here we have now a whole new election uh, investigation in which the administration mired down. That membership on this committee is called for the impeachment of the president. He wants to sit as an objective investigator into allegations. It's, it's, uh, it, for, for those of us to even assume that these hearings could be fair, um, runs against the grain, and to try to defend these practices of the investigation in which the minority has no rights that the majority is willing to recognize, um, really is uh, the, the, the credibility of the empire. And I think that what we should do, Mr. Chairman, is to try to sit down, come up with a shared consensus how to go forward and have an investigation in which this Congress uh, can look at all of the allegations that have been made about improper activities and campaigns and not just try to look at what the Democratic Party may have done. It is not a perfect party, I'm sure, nor is the campaign process uh, perfect, but I'm also as equally certain uh, that there have been wrongdoings uh, by Republicans. And since we reformed the system, we just want to find out about the wrongdoings at least look at both sides of the Will the, uh, gentleman, both sides of the gentleman yield? I yield. I want to for yielding. I want to my good friend from California for I have the highest regard and respect. Almost prepared to say affection. I'm, I'm delighted that you publicly recognized 
that the investigation that uh, Mr. Shays conducted was a moral investigation. And I would like to, and, and no one will be more fulsome in praise for Chris Shays during that investigation than I. Chris Shays behaved as a model congressman during that whole investigation. And we'll agree investigation's tone set by the and the majority. It takes two to tango. It takes tango. And the majority begins by depriving the minority of all meaningful participation. There is no way to cooperate with such a procedure. Not one single decision during the HUD investigation full prior consultation with Mr. Shays and with his full concurrence. I want to repeat that. Every single decision concerning that protracted 27 investigation and failed full prior consultation and full concurrence being Republican minority member. Now, that clearly is not the proposal here. So, I welcome my friend's organization of my investigation as a model investigation. I would like to remind him that it was a model investigation because Mr. Shea functioned in an exemplary fashion and the chairman of that investigation provided full equality to the Republican minority to participate in all relevant decisions. Yield. I'll be delighted. I would simply suggest ask his colleague Sorry. time to yield. I'd, All right. uh, I'd simply ask the gentleman on your left if he has not been given the names of the people for whom the chair wanted to issue a subpoena. And the question is, did he respond? As he answers back. If, if the gentleman who has the time would yield to me. We have been given names, but no opportunity comment that's meaningful because the chairman uh, listened to what we have to say and then decide unilaterally. And that's on the committee has the, fi has the final say on these issues, chairman, that is the of every, every investigation that is conducted in our memory. And I would be to cite the fact that Chairman Klinger, who this committee, a Republican chairman, followed same process in deposition. How much time has expired? expired. Unusual. Well, I've tried to be very fair. In fact, I think three or four members of the minority we've extended one or two of the Republicans do that. Mr. Pappas? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, to yield my time to you like to make any comments. I think. Let me just start off by saying there has been a single where the ranking minority member has not gotten at least 24 hours copies of correspondence requesting documents or proposed subpoenas. Now the ranking minority member has chosen, and he has the right to do that, not to give me any kind of response or a phone call or anything else to tell me whether or not he objects or whether he'd like to have changes in either the letters or the subpoenas. So, you know, that's his choice. has been consulted, chosen not to participate. In addition to that, I just say that we are in conformity. One second. We have a. Uh, we have complied uh, uh, with with the October. Uh, uh, language on subpoena authority, the Iran Contra subpoena authority, the minority has and will continue consulted. We've gone even beyond that. We've given them three working days' notice of any subpoenas. And so we're doing our deadline to make sure that we do. There will be minority at deposition here around the country. 
around the world. And so they will be informed and they will be an active participant. The only subpoenas that they participated in and chosen to participate in were all Republican subpoenas. When we wrote to them about Democratic subpoenas, there was no response. When we wrote to them with letters regarding Democrats, there was no response. However, we wrote regarding the letters, uh, the Republican nationality, they did respond and we did incorporate some of their requests into our subpoenas. We subpoenaed the 1990 Senate House Dinner Committee. Young Brothers Development Company, Young Brothers Development Company USA Incorporated, Richard Richards, the National Policy Forum, Ambrose Young, Barnett Bank, Signet Bank, and the RNC regarding foreign contributions. Now, we have not subpoenaed Mr. Barber, nor have we subpoenaed Mr. Fowler or Senator Chris Dodd, who is the head of the DNC. Now, we may at some point in the future, but we will call the minority before we do that and give them ample time to respond to us. One more thing uh, I, I want to uh, uh, comment on, that is, I think that uh, many people ought to look seriously at most favored trading status for China uh, from the standpoint of whether or not they cooperate with us, people like Mr. Tree uh, regarding his involvement in the contributions. If you understand he's in China right now, he has a restaurant there, he has a, a residence there, and if we could get the help of the Chinese government, it would go a long way toward uh, creating a better atmosphere with the, with the Chinese. And with that, I thank you for yielding the rest, the rest of the time. My time. What was it to me to respond? Mr. Pappas, you have to yield back the balance of my time. Yield back, yield back the balance of the time. Uh, well, the gentlelady yielded to me. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, actually, uh, I would like to respond. <laughs> so let me respond uh, uh, to the chairman's uh, comments and, and add my voice really to the ranking members that this is an unfair, partisan, unprecedented hearing that, that it's extremely unfair to individuals dragging the first time in history laterally and deposing them. And uh, the chairman mentioned two particular hearings being, uh, he mentioned the House October Surprise Investigation and the Joint Iran Conflict Investigation. And never, ever did these committees use this authority. They issue uh, the subpoenas upon consultation. I would like to put into the record a from Lee Hamilton, who chaired those hearings. Copies of this letter to be available on the desk for the public. And I would like to read in just two points that Mr. Hamilton made. And he said, and I quote, as a matter of practice in the Iran-Contra investigation, the four congressional leaders of the select committee made decisions jointly on all procedural issues, including the issuance of subpoenas the taking of depositions, end quote. Then Mr. Hamilton said, with respect to the October surprise, of course, I followed a similar approach. I do not recall issuing a single deposition notice without the ranking member's concurrence, end quote. And I'd like this put in the record. I'd like this chart put in the record. It shows that this has never, ever, ever been before to anyone. And as we said two months ago, when we voted on the procedures of the that were again unfair and unilateral, they have issued 150 subpoenas unilaterally. Now they want to go out and haul individuals in unilaterally, anyone uh, they want to talk to, without any type of joint uh, participation. We should be doing what many of our colleagues have talked about, and that is sincere campaign finance reform. Mr. Horn has a, a bill, Mr. Shays has an important bill in. We should be working with the influence of special interest money and foreign um, countries' money. Yet, go. The Republican leadership, the Republican leadership would not vote 
to fund to the level that the one bipartisan commission that is created to investigate investigations. They grant uh, the, the Federal Election Commission the $1.8 million that they say they need to hire investigators to work on work before them. They have voted 12 to $15 million for this committee to conduct their partisan investigation. It is unfair. It is wrong. Months ago, I asked one simple question. I said, when have you ever, in this Congress, before any committee, before any uh, chairman in either the House or the Senate, when have you ever had this unprecedented party? The silence was deafening. Again, the same question. When has this, this authority been granted and used? And I yield to the ranking I just to take a few seconds, and I think that was an excellent statement given to clarify what's been happening. But for the record, we were in four subpoenas that we went to when the process was not in place and the subpoenas were issued anyway. Uh, this is not uh, anything, a notice presentation that we've received it really is unprecedented. Was a gentle lady yield to me? I presume she will since she's not here. Let me just say she before <laughs> Let me just say before we recess that uh, the authority was granted for this subpoena power in October sur surprise and in Iran Contra. It may but it was granted. And we're going to the chair uh, uh, hold the committee in recess until one o'clock, so members before they come back from the vote. The committee will reconvene and come to order. Uh, Mr. Barrett, we understand you have some statements like to make. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to make an opening statement. I think that, that we're at pretty important in this committee hearing, and I concur with by my Democratic colleagues about the fairness issues um, that uh, I think right now, as the public looks at this hearing, um, they look at it basically as a witch hunt. There's absolutely no that is being look at uh, transgressions that may have been um, committed by members of the Republican Party. And I fervently believe that our function is to uncover wrong wherever it is. And I think that we lose credibility as a committee by merely uh, placing the emphasis on allegations made against the President and the administration. Um, but that has been, and I think that the American people understand that. I'm more concerned with, in terms of what we're doing today, is the basic fairness of what, and I have an amendment that I'm offering um, that deals with several components of this proposed, I think, um, uh, objective is pretty much a no-brainer. I don't see where anybody would have problems with, with this amendment. And essentially what it does is it, it, it goes at three issues. The first issue to the, the problem has arisen because of the way the proposed rule has been drafted. Under the proposed rule, I, <coughs> excuse me, I or any other member, not staff, I or any other member of the minority party will not be able to ask any questions in deposition until the staff for the Republican Party is finished with its questioning. 
if the chairman designates the staff for questioner. So I would have to sit there in that room for one, two, three days as a member, as an elected member of Congress, and listen to questioning from staff. Would the gentleman yield, please? I'd be more than happy. Uh, it, it has been a process of uh, the committee in the past that when members to uh, make a, a witness during that, uh, that the staff, uh, even if they're in the middle, will member for whatever questions they want to ask for whatever duration, and that uh, our staff, our committee staff, will be instructed to accord the minority or the majority whenever they come in and want to ask questions. So if we are in the process of taking a deposition, and a minority or majority member comes in and wants to ask questions, uh, staff will be ordered to uh, suspend and allow that question. Well, Mr. Chairman, re reclaim my time. I'm strong believer in uh, obviously I've had many many partisan problems on the committee thus far as to what has been agreed to what has not been agreed to there can be no disagreement you or your council agree that under this rule as it is proposed the, the, my, the Republican staff member that you have selected to ask questions can ask questions until that question is done. And I, as an elected member, as a Democrat elected member of this committee, cannot ask any questions until that particular time. Now, they may be, there may be a squabble. And in that case, they do what we do on the committee. They reclaim their time. But these investigations are professional investigations. They are not investigations. And I think it makes a of this procedure to have a procedure where a staff member, a Republican staff member, has greater rights than an elected member of Congress. To remedy that, what I have simply proposed is just we have in committee hearings that cabinet rounds, and I don't think that that works frankly in a situation, but we can have our rounds. So my amendment will say that you will have our rounds up to an so that you would go back and forth. It's sort of fairness. You get to ask questions, ask questions. You get to ask questions, we get to ask questions. Not only because only our right questions would not then be dependent upon or the mood of the majority members who are controlling that hearing, that deposition at that time. So I think if we want this or this investigation to have any credibility at all, which I think is questionable at this time to begin with. What we do is, is have it so that the Democratic, elected Democratic members of Congress do not that are subservient to Republican staff members. The second problem to, tends to deal with or deal with is the problem of transcriptions of depositions. There has been a problem thus far that has not received copies of the deposition until weeks and sometimes months after that deposition has been what my amendment tries to do again a good faith to try to make this a fair proceeding is to the majority side gets the deposition the minority side gets the deposition. again fairness let's try to be fair to both sides why is this a problem the reason it's a problem the chairman has mentioned may be deposing the witnesses and if the majority has a copy of a deposition from a prior witness and can use that deposition in a subsequent deposition, not have access to the deposition, we are at a great disadvantage in preparing our questions. I'd be more than happy to you. Uh, we talked to the ranking minority member provision. Well, I knew you'd see it's one of these things, so I appreciate that, sir. The, the third and, and, and the third amendment uh, deals with the question of staff. Uh, and we've had much debate today over whether there is adequate staff or whether there is not adequate staff. Um, frankly, we're a low budget operation on this side of the aisle, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I have with me today my personal staff, staff me on this committee. The proposed rule does not give the ranking minority member the authority to designate a staff person, a personal staff person, member um, for Obviously, that staff 
uh, have any rights to ask any questions. Um, but we simply staff on this side of the aisle um, to allow each member who may be chosen to attend one of these depositions to bring someone from there to sit in that hearing with them. So what my amendment would do would be to allow that person, uh, or ranking minority member, Mr. designate a personal staff member. Uh, again, begging at the trough here, because you hold all the horses, you have the ability to determine who goes in that room. I'm only looking for fairness here. And, and I think that these proposals are absolutely fair, and, and I can't it wouldn't be um, wouldn't anybody who, who having a fair proceeding here. Um, so I will be offering, I would yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Does anyone else? Mr. Snowbarger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just comments. Um, first of all, it's been interesting to me as I vote the Congress into this committee uh, that uh, lost sight of what we're trying to invest in, in the first place. And I think the this investigation is is um, because to me as we of the investigation of uh, lose focus both for our resources and for our attention in my impression this began uh, as issues were raised last fall dealing with the administration's fundraising and uh, questions about uh, quid pro quo for that fundraising which might have been uh, illegal for the last what we've been hearing is that of these hearings is going to be judged whether or not we have equal numbers of Democratic subpoenas versus Republican subpoenas, equal numbers of Democratic depositions versus Republican depositions, numbers of Republican targets and Democratic targets. It seems to me that uh, if we go back to the original thrust of this investigation and that of administration fundraising, the possibility of illegal quid pro quo, uh, we need to be hunting for the duck car. When the investigation of HUD, the focus was on uh, administration officials. Uh, that the uh, other is suggesting that subpoenaing, subpoenaing, opposing HUD investigation because of charge at that point in time. I think the same argument should be made here. We had uh, lists early on in this uh, in these proceedings in April, where long lists of Democrats were were posed, short list of Republicans. The fact of the matter is the Democratic administration, and uh, perhaps if we want to do it proportionately based on the Republicans that the Democrats have been in the administration, uh, maybe that's a more accurate uh, measure of fairness. And with that, I would yield uh, time to Mr. Micah. Mr. Chairman, I'll pass the time. Uh, gentleman uh, yields back my time. Very much, Mr. Chairman. After listening to from this side of the aisle, it's clear to me that we are not about investigations. As a matter of fact, it sounds like we welcome them. We're not opposed to the granting of subpoena power <coughs> for the taking of deposition. I think that there are times it is prudent to do so. We feel that people accused are suspected of wrongdoing should be exempt from I believe in something called fairness. If we are to be fair, we must just investigate not just the Democrats. We will go across the board and investigate all components of the system in question. We will not have a partisan one sided political investigation. We will have a balanced investigation, which includes the White House, Democrats, and Republicans alike. Information we have regarding campaign finance investigation suggests to me, Mr. Chairman, that as chairman, you should 155 subpoenas. 56 of them were issued to investigate Democratic funding. 
without the concurrence of the ranking member or any kind of vote from this committee. I know that the member requested that the chairman issue a total of 38 subpoenas to Republicans. Nine of those were actually issued. I'm told that Mr. Chairman sent out an additional 127 requests for documents, that 126 of those were related to alleged Democratic fundraising abuses. And only one document request was sent to a Republican target. I'm told that you issued 292 subpoenas and document requests, and that 282 of them were targeted at alleged Democratic fundraising abuses, and only 10 involved are targeted towards abuses. I'm told that approximately 320,000 pages of documents have been provided to the committee in response to those requests. These include over 100,000 pages from the DNC, 50,000 pages from the White House. Only 15 pages were provided by Republican targets, all from the RN Republican National Committee. Now, I know that sometimes situations be one side and a lot of one side situations in our society. The distance between Chicago Bulls and the rest of the NBA teams is one sided. There can be a difference and there can be some very if we want to be fair. If we are seeking truth and nothing else, then the proposed route we have before us cannot do it. However, I am hard because I know that there are elements which will be coming. And I believe that if those be accepted, then they would give us the opportunity to move ahead with this investigation in a fair, prudent, Partisan manner. So I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yield, yield back if he has time still. I would be pleased to yield time to the ranking member. I thank you for yielding because I, I just want to underscore the point you're making. We asked to issue subpoenas with regard to the Republican National Committee Chief Haley Barber, who engineered, according to press reports, a $2 million guarantee from Chinese Ambrose Tung Young. A group called the National Policy Forum, which is an affiliate and debtor of the committee. And we came in and requested subpoenas. He issued a few subpoenas as per our request, but refused to issue a subpoena to Haley Barber, the man who helped this issue. Uh, I, I, will, I, I want to complete my uh, statement. If we're going to look at finance abuses, quick close they ought to be investigated. The tobacco issue is one of the major contributors to the Republican Party. We asked for a subpoena on a campaign fund on the Republican side, a response from the chairman. We asked that the uh, investigation be conducted about using federal facilities for, the for fundraising. And Mr. Burton refused subpoenas to the uh, Senate committee or the committee, even though he issued many subpoenas on the Democratic side. The point I'm making is all we can do is make a request to the chairman, and like all prayers are answered, just some in the negative, we're not participants. This is a one-sided question. I thank the gentleman. Has expired. Mr. Cummins. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I um, tell you, I'm sitting here as a member, and it is uh, a little bit frustrating to listen to all of this and um, try to understand where we're going. A few weeks ago, uh, Mr. Condit 
said some things that really touched me very much. He talked about the way we've got going or more, and we seem to be wasting people's money, the taxpayers' money. Then I just conducted 10 town hall meetings, Republicans and Democrats, even with the Republicans. But what they have said in all 10 of these town hall meetings concerned about wasting their money. Over and over, I heard the words, I want government cost, efficient, and effective. I heard that over and over again. I said, I don't mind you taxing me, but be cost, efficient, and effective. Then I look at um, two organizations that I have a respect for. And I don't think anybody would call them partisan in any way. Women, women's President Becky came April 11, 1997, said the House investigation is a travesty. And I'm quoting her. The House is headed, headed towards a partisan showdown. Today, the kind of political game discussed the American people. And I must say that Mr. Kane, the president of the League of Women's was right on point with my Republican and Democratic constituents. I'm Laura's president and bride back on April 8, 1997, something similar. And this is not a partisan statement because I think looks at things fairly. Quote, she says, the committee, talking about our committee, must be scrupulously fair. Fairness will be ensured only in the most congressional precedent get investigative procedures and members a voice in the investigation. It is dead wrong for a committee chairman to authority to unilaterally issue a subpoena. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go into what newspapers are saying because, I mean, we can argue here and there, but I'm talking about two organizations which I all respect. And I have a question. There's been a lot of kiss keeping the system on good balance. There's been I talk about blurring the issues. As I have listened very to uh, this side of the aisle, I want to choose this side of the aisle, and I've been here just about the whole time here today. I hear, I don't hear the side of the aisle saying Democratic problems. I have not heard that yet. And what we have said is what we said back in April, and I think it's, very, it's been very clear. And I even remember asking the chairman, uh, we uh, follow uh, the problems wherever they may lead. In other words, uh, wrongdoing, we follow it. And he assured me, yes. What we're asking for, and I think the American people are asking for, they merely want, they see their tax dollars being spent, they see their kids unable to get into college, have the money, they see taxes, all kinds of tax problems, and all do. They don't mind us investigating. They want simply for whatever we do, be cost efficient and effective. Mr. Back there in April made a very excellent statement asking the chair to look into the, to the situation we have. The Senate investigating the same thing we're investigating. Now that we'll have over the world, some way it seems to me investigations can be combined so that the American people can feel better. And so here today, we take this time and try to address these problems to ask, and ask all of us to be concerned about the very people that we that sent us here. One store trying to make it as best he can. The people trying to put their kids through college. Folks that are being thrown out of housing because they just lost their all of them and concerned. And so I speak for them. I speak for those people who merely want the best of government. The time that I have left, I yield to Ms. Maloney, who requested earlier. Thank, thank you very much. And I, I just would like to follow up on the statements of the ranking member, and really uh, Mr. Davis and Mr. Cummings. There has been 
given a whole uh, list of examples of Harbor foreign money, but uh, gained a contribution to foreign money. I have a question, Mr. Burton. What does it take to subpoena Haley Barton? We have uh, been at information from the Republican, uh, or asked for the Democrat National, National Committee. They have complied. We find that it's necessary to subpoena Mr. Dodd, former head of the DNC, Mr. Fowler, former head of the DNC, or Mr. Barber, and we will do it. So far, there's not been any reason to, uh, to uh, subpoena any one of those individuals because we've been getting cooperation from them in the RNC, find that we need to do that. We will subpoena Senator Dodd. We will subpoena Mrs. Mr. Fowler and Mr. Barber. Mr. Chairman, you have mentioned here. Yeah, and the gentleman's time has expired. Time. Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Wax, committee. I think as it would be important for us to uh, back a moment and to uh, reflect on the context in which these hearings uh, uh, will occur before the people. Us in the Congress who are uh, concerned about corruption and finance. But Congress who are certainly concerned about corruption the relationship between them and uh, campaign know there's a problem with the system. I want us to do something about it. It's uh, certainly incumbent upon us. We look to the uh, various problems which uh, will come before us, evidence by the testimony will be later on, and the evidence will be presented. That for changing the campaign laws in the country. There's a need for bringing about campaign reform, and there's a need to clean up the system. That is not outside the purview of this committee to uh, be looking at involved as a committee towards reform. To have a responsibility for cleaning up the mess. Both parties, for that reason, work together in this investigation. Because if we have an outcome which would make function in a manner democratic and protective of the rights of the people, the only way we can do that is to find a way, work together as a committee, partisan differences, that's apparent. Partisan differences should not be in a position where we are unable to produce an outcome which will have credibility for the American people. We're really here to make this faith in government, not to damage it further, and to renew people's faith in the Congress of the United States. Congress does have a responsibility to look at these matters, to be sure. And Congress does have a right, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this committee does have a right, and we are appropriately addressing this issue. But we have to ask what our purpose is. It's to investigate, certainly. It's to identify wrongdoing, certainly, and it's to set what is wrong right. But if we're going to do that, we have to do it in an even-handed way. We have to do it so the American people can know that we are sincerely looking at making a system work better on their behalf and not simply involved in a uh, game of partisan sniping. We have to also look at the context of the country itself and the concerns of the American people. They want the political system to work. Why? Because they want to make sure that they're able to survive financially. They want to make sure that this system of government can meet their economic needs, their practical aspirations for jobs, and decent housing, and good education, and good health care. That's the context in which these hearings occur in the country. People know that honest government is essential to making things happen for them. They also know that no one party has cornered the market on honesty and integrity. And I contend, uh, with all due respect to the chair, that any inequities in the investigation 
will be the undoing of the investigation itself and will lead to a discredit of the committee. Uh, the question should never be whether or not the chair is an honorable person because I, well, I'm new to this Congress. I personally believe the chair is an honorable person and I want you to know, Mr. Chairman, I am proud to serve with you in this Congress. I truly am and I look forward to working with you. And my concern as a new member is that if we proceed in a manner which does not appear to the American people to be even handed, that we will forfeit the opportunity to really clean up this system, which we have an opportunity to do, in which the chair has taken uh, this serious responsibility upon himself to move forward. Uh, I would also add one other note of concern. Uh, I heard mention earlier about the uh, fact of Mr. Tree's uh, un un cooperativeness with the committee. And, and I think the chair is well taken in calling that to uh, the attention of the committee. Uh, but I also think that in this committee, in order to keep this investigation focused and to make the investigation accomplish its purpose of protecting and cleaning up the system, that we also have to be careful of creating any linkages, such as a linkage between what this country's trade policies might be with China and whether or not uh, uh, a single witness is produced who's in that country. Uh, that could raise further questions about the intention of this uh, committee. I'm proud to be a member of this committee. I'm proud to join here with other members of the committee on what is surely a most important challenge, and that is a challenge to find where there have been abuses of the system, to make those abuses public, to challenge those who are responsible, to set right the record, but in the final analysis, to clean the system up. And we can't do that if it's just one party operating unilaterally. We need to work together, and I certainly appreciate the uh, points which Mr. Waxman has raised in that regard, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, who seeks time? Mr. Towns. Mr. Chairman, basically, I'm a pretty mild-mannered guy, you know, and don't get too excited about things too much. But I must admit that I am outright angry when I look and I think about how we're getting ready to waste money. Uh, I understand today that the majority will vote to strip this committee's minority of the right to be included in, in the prosecution of this investigation. We will have no voice in the issuance of subpoenas or the treatment of witnesses. We have been told that we must be willing to walk lockstep or go home. These actions by the Republican majority are not only a complete departure from the previous congressional investigations, but an affront to all notions of fundamental fairness and democracy. Mr. Chairman, those of us who sit on this side of the aisle also represent significant constituencies. In your attempt to silence us, you have actually silenced them. The right of the minority of this committee have been abused to investigate a matter that is outside of the true mission of this committee. According to the rules of the House, this committee has given the important task of finding and fixing waste, fraud and abuse in the federal government. By correcting these things, we promote economy and efficiency. At the beginning of this session of Congress, each of us voted on this rule and pledged to continue the significant mission of this committee. Therefore, I was shocked to learn that the majority has wasted government funds already in this investigation. This committee has spent $40,000 on a computer database that only the Republican majority will be able to use. This database has been compiled using documents obtained by this committee from government entities or through the use of the congressional subpoena power. This is a committee resource. This is not a Republican resource, and we need to understand that. And let me state this clearly. The Democrats are members of this committee as well. When committee funds are spent to buy resources used in committee business, every member of this committee is entitled to the use and benefits of those resources. Yet we on the Democratic side of the aisle have been told that we cannot use the database. The Republican majority has told us that committee 
can spend an additional $40,000 if Democrats want to replace the same documents on a computer. Why do we have to spend $40,000 when you've already spent $40,000, when the committee has already spent $40,000? This is a waste. This is the, not only the height of absurdity, but the exact kind of petty behavior that causes anger, apathy about, and apathy about government. If a federal agency that we are required to oversee spent money on resources that only some of the employees were allowed to use, we would investigate them immediately. Mr. Chairman, if hypocrisy is not your intention, you must allow members of the committee to have access to the database or you must pay for it with non-committee resources. You can't use committee dollars and then tell us that we cannot use it. Have if you insist on denying members of this committee access to a committee resource, then an investigation should be launched. Mr. Chairman, let me make it very clear. Today I am sending a letter to the Inspector General of the House to request an investigation of the majority's use of $40,000 in committee funds on a computer database which it will not share with the Democratic members of this committee. I'm asking that the Inspector General of the House of Representatives determine whether the Republican refusal to share the equipment and information with other members of this committee constitute a waste of committee resources. And I'm asking that other members of this committee who believe that we should practice the economy and efficiency be we preached to other federal agencies, join me in this request. Let me say, I am troubled, I am angry, because I know in terms of the homelessness that exists in this country, people walking around with no medical care. I mean, I think that it's a shame and a disgrace for us to waste money here uh, trying to range for one party to get an advantage over another party. And that's exactly what is happening here. And I'm asking the Inspector General to look at it and put a stop to it. I yield back. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. Does anyone else seek time? Who's it? Uh, we, we don't want to cut off uh, discussion, Mr. Tierney. Mr. Tierney, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Right. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry to say that I don't share some of the patience that some of the other members do here. And Mr. Kucinich, I know, is well intended and probably a lot more reserved than I am. When he talks about being pride, proud to be on this committee, he must find a pride somewhere that I can't find. Because there's nothing proud about serving on a committee that's going to produce a product that's not credible, a report that's not going to be comprehensive, and that's not going to really contain any basis for reform, which is what the American people want out of this committee, what they have a right to accept and expect. There's nothing to be proud about when we read about people that are supposedly in charge of this investigation being reported in editorial after editorial for questions about their own actions in their past, yet they have an unwillingness to include in both parties in this investigation and try and find something that has gone wrong, if anything has gone wrong, and set about to make it better. This is a partisan investigation, and nobody thinks anything otherwise. This committee, unfortunately, people on this side of the aisle don't have to associate themselves with the acts of this committee because we have not been included, but this committee is a laughing stock. It's a laughing stock of most editorials that you read. It's a laughing stock of people in this country. And when I go home into my district, people tell me that they think this entire investigation is so partisan and so ego-driven, Mr. Chairman, that basically it's a laughing stock. There is nothing that's going on that, that is less than partisanship. It obviates any credibility this committee would have. It absolutely excludes any prospect that we are going to get to the bottom of what, if anything, is wrong with our electoral process and the way we finance it. And frankly, I think I would join in others to question whether or not that's the intention. While I'm talking, any of the members on the other side that feel that they want to associate with the conduct that's gone on so far, with the failure to share the database, with people having misrepresentations made to them as to why they're being questioned without minority members having been included in that, stand up. Show us that you want to be included in that, and we'll know who wants a fair process and who doesn't. If you want an investigation that really makes a difference and you want the American people to stand behind, here's your opportunity. Co-opt us. Make us part of that investigation. Let us decide with you who should be subpoenaed, where documents should come from, what the question should be. This is supposed to be an open and public forum for people to discern what, if anything, went wrong with the electoral process. You have the ability to make it that way. You've shown no inclination to lean in that direction. You've shown no respect 
for this committee at all, for the committee process, for this institution. There's been a duplication of the Senate's effort. There's been an absolute disgraceful waste of money for these taxpayers. This committee won't get anything accomplished, Mr. Chairman, until you start treating it like a committee, until you start treating all the members of this committee with respect. I give back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. Is there further discussion? If not, uh, I now call. Mr. Ford? Gentleman Rick, he's, gentleman Thank you. Rick, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very, very brief. I really wanted to just associate myself with some of the remarks that have been made, particularly with colleagues on this side of the aisle and the other side of the aisle for that matter. But I would just add this one point. As a, one of the younger members of this body uh, and a member of Generation X, I would say to those who, particularly in my generation, who have been turned off by politics and the process, say to the chairman that this committee and the way we've conducted ourselves certainly does not lend any credibility to the notion that this Congress and that the political process indeed can work. As we look at many of the issues that face this nation and the fact that this next generation of Americans will shoulder many of those responsibilities and obligations, I would think that this nation and this Congress in particular would try to find ways to build that trust, build on that trust, and really to create an atmosphere where young people can feel they can be a part of the political process. The cynicism, the skepticism, the suspicion that young people have I must say that the way we've conducted this investigation, Mr. Chairman, unfortunately has done nothing to diminish that or undermine it. As a matter of fact, it's done more to perpetuate and expand that than anything else. I would also ask the Chairman, and as, as, as we move forward and all of the issues of fairness and equity and credibility have been raised and exhausted really on both sides of the aisle, but I would remind the Chairman that the only real investigation that my generation has any recollection of is the Watergate investigation. And I might add that certainly uh, contributed to much of the skepticism that people have about politicians even today. Uh, the distrust that Americans uh, uh, around the nation have for politicians, this committee is helping to fuel that and add to that. But I would say that the recollections that many of us in my generation have about Watergate, Chairman Irvin, and certainly Ranking Member Baker from my state of Tennessee, that fairness certainly pervaded that process. And as we move forward here, I would admonish my chairman and my ranking member uh, and the committee members on this Reform and Oversight Committee, who's been entrusted, I might add, with a fairly prodigious responsibility, to let us take the lead from the Senate. Let us take the lead from Chairman Irvin, and certainly from Ranking Member Baker, and even from those on the Senate side today, as they look into these very, very important matters. This is certainly not meant to suggest where there might have been wrongdoing. What it is meant to suggest, Mr. Chairman, is that we're not conducting this in a fair way. We're not conducting in a way as my good friend from Philadelphia, Mr. Fatah, said in a way that's going to provide any credibility once this process ends. So I say to members of my generation, please forgive those of us here in Congress for not having the good wisdom and the good sense to do what's right. And I uh, hopefully will prevail upon my chairman and even my ranking member to do what's right, add some credibility, restore some fairness, and include the minority party in the consultations as well as the deliberations that go on in this committee. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Chairman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Sessions of Texas. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, with regard to the comments that have been taken here, Mr. Chairman, I might, uh, if I can, have us digress in our thinking back about Watergate and about Iran-Contra and about October Surprise in that the success, if it could be termed success, of bipartisanship that took place in each and every single one of those hearings took place as a result of Republicans who were in the minority then and people who represented the party of the president that was in power at that time. Each and every one of those hearings were done in bipartisanship because there was at least one Republican who decided that there were constitutional issues that were involved. Senator Baker, Senator Warren Rugman decided that there were constitutional issues. That is why it became bipartisan. We have been waiting all these six months that I've been on this committee, and I've said this, I've given this same speech several times. We're waiting for one Democrat to come across the line. You have every single bit of the information that we have. Checks, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of checks that have been laundered, filtered in this country, what we believe is illegally. We have subpoenaed witnesses time after time. They've taken the Fifth Amendment. 
There's no one on that side who is participating, not one Democrat. To be bipartisan, it takes two sides. I can tell you as I hear you talk about the unfairness and the bitterness of this, I'm disappointed too. I'm a freshman, but I know, no sir, I will not at this time, but I will tell you that the money that you're receiving and the databases and the people that you get is equally consistent with what the minority party has always received. There is no change in what we're doing. The same rules that took place that we're getting ready to vote on, the same committee, committee subpoena authority, same as under Iran-Contra, same as under October Surprise, the same staffing levels. We don't need to share computers. Do with what you with, with, as you want to do with your own computer. You have the money, you have the resources, go buy your own toys. But quit complaining. Come be bipartisan in this. Join us halfway. You have the documents before you that talk and show clearly about serious questions of constitutional law. Come gentleman. be with us. Come be a part of us. I will yield. Yes, sir. Thank you. Could I just ask the gentleman if he could indicate to me when, this, uh, when we've had the opportunity to vote uh, on a subpoena and so that we could show our support for subpoenaing certain records uh, involving Democratic fundraising, and when, conversely, we've had the opportunity to call for votes so that we could subpoena questions around the laundering of millions of dollars in terms of dollars that ended up in Republican campaigns. I'll recoup my time. Thank you. I sat here in this committee and listened to us as we voted on what the scope of our authority is. We do not have the authority to go into fundraising as it relates to political campaigns. The authority of this committee very strictly is controlled by our oversight of the judicial branch and the executive branch I of government. Agree. We well, have no more authority. I agree, but if the Mr. Chairman yield, he's interrupting my time. Will the gentleman yield? I will not. Oh, Mr. Mr. Mike, I will yield. Uh, That's bipartisan thank you. Spirit. That was very bipartisan of you. Well, he wants yeah. to. I did allow he you the opportunity, sir. He allowed a, a chance on that side and a response from this side, and I appreciate his spirit of bipartisanship. I have a list of the 160 Definition. subpoenas that we issued. Now, we have John Wong, who's fled the country, Webster Hubble, who's done the fifth, Pauline Kanchanilak, and any of the subpoenas that went to them also went to folks who were, or their bank accounts, or uh, people that were involved with their holdings. Uh, Mark Middleton pled the fifth, Charlie Tree in Beijing, Lee, uh, Gandhi, the uh, Riotti family, the pages go on. And, and then at the end, we do have the Republican uh, uh, abuser here, Mr. Young, and he, uh, his folks were served with a subpoena. I have a list of all the people who received money. They, these are all the members of Congress and the political organization. We have about a half a dozen Republican. The balance of this page, dozens of them are all Democrats who received this money. Now, where has the unfairness been? We ha or who should not have gotten a subpoena that, that either pled the fifth or fled the country? That's what this is about. We are now six months into this, and they have delayed. They have stonewalled. They have blocked us. They have refused to give us documents. The White House has played jokes with this. We're six months into this. Now, let me tell you on the other side what you're doing. You're going to get this into the election cycle, maybe by the time Mr. Thompson's done. And we will be conducting this investigation on your watch in your 98 election campaign if you continue to further delay and destroy this process. Let's get it done. Let's be big men and women and get the job done, investigate it. Here's where the money went, and there's who gave the money. If you have others, Bring them forward, and let's do the job I in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, I, any uh, objection you had when we did the protocol, there are people on this side who supported uh, your efforts to make the protocol fair. Uh, in this process today, you brought up some good points. We yielded to those points. We want to conduct the investigation. We want it to go forward. We don't want delays. We want to be bipartisan. We want fairness, and we'll work with you. Uh, let's get it done. They gave money to Republicans, too. 
that these folks should be investigated. The process should be improved and corrected, and we should be a part of that process in a fair and open fashion. Gentlemen's Thank you. Time Mr. Has, Chairman. Gentlemen's Chairman. time has expired. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Condit. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm anxious to move this process along, and I don't want to get into 1998, so I'm anxious for us to offer our amendments and, and get moving along, but I must uh, uh, yield uh, some time to the ranking member to respond. I just want to correct the record and the previous two uh, gentlemen on the Republican side are just misinformed about the, 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 the facts and the rules. First of all, our committee does have jurisdiction over all campaign finance abuses. He can't use that as an excuse to say that's why we're not going to investigate Republican abuses. Secondly, the precedents have always been that no single individual, even if he's chairman, can unilaterally issue subpoenas. What we're asking for, and we'll have the opportunity in a few minutes to offer an amendment, is to uh, go to the same procedures that have always been used where subpoenas are issued by concurrence or a vote of the committee. A, a committee, by the way, which has a majority Republicans. Will the, the gentleman subpoenas, yield? The subpoenas will be issued uh, and, and if, uh, the, if, the, uh, if there's a partisan difference. Thirdly, no one here on this side of the aisle is arguing we shouldn't bring all these characters in for subpoenas and for depositions. We don't disagree with that. And we have nothing to do whatsoever with those who have taken the Fifth Amendment. We haven't talked to them. We haven't urged that upon them. We have had no role in that. And for the gentleman from Florida to accuse us of it is thoroughly irresponsible. And then next point I want to make is that we, at the very beginning, suggested that we have an independent investigator so that there would be a clear nonpartisan involvement in the looking at these abuses at the White House so long as the Congress was going to do a fair investigation on other abuses. So I, I just think that the statements we've heard, given fervently but incorrectly, um, the record should be uh, corrected, and I appreciate the gentleman from California yielding to me for that purpose. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Is there further? Mr. Uh, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Haster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just very briefly, you know, I'm kind of a no-nonsense, and you don't hear me talk a lot in this uh, committee on and on and on. But I am chairman of the <clears throat> National Security Subcommittee. I'm concerned there's a lot of things that have happened. There are money has flowed, we think, from the Chinese government. Uh, we think money has come in from Hong Kong. Uh, money has come certainly through the Ri Riotti family. Uh, there's banking issues involved. Uh, we need to get down to the discussion and be able to depose people and find out what the facts are. I think what this committee wants to do is to look at the issues, find the facts, Everybody has the ability to sit on the, uh, on the <coughs> uh, depositions, and let's find out what, where the chips fall. I think that's what we owe the American people. That's what this committee's responsibility in the Congress is to do. And the lo longer that we sit here and uh, trade uh, political insults back and forth, uh, the less soon that the American people are going to find out what they need to know. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think we need to move on. Let's go to the amendments. And uh, let's move the process. The f sooner that we move the process, the sooner the American people are going to know what the facts are. I yield Thank back my time. Gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I now call up the two new proposed committee rules 20 and 21. Without objection, the rules are considered as read and are open to amendment at any time. And the clerk will report the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Amendment in the nature of the substitute considered as base tax for the purpose of amendment. Without objection, the amendment in the nature of a substitute will be considered as read and as original text for the purpose of amendment. Are there any amendments to the amendment in the nature of a substitute? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Waxman. I have an amendment that I'd offer on behalf of Mr. Konjorski and myself. The clerk will report the amendment. On page 1 in line 14, insert the following new sentence. Not I ask unanimous consent the amendment rules. be considered as read. Uh, objection. Uh, their obje objection is heard. The amendment will be read. Uh, I, uh, reserving the right to object, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman reserves the right to object. Uh, if I might, Mr. Chairman, uh, 
My assumption is that the amendment is reasonably short and it might actually be helpful to us since we don't know which amendments are coming up in which order to hear which amendment it is. Does the gentleman object? Uh, I object. The gentleman objects. The clerk will read the amendment. On page 1 in line 14, insert the following new sentence. Notwithstanding committee rule 18D, the chairman shall not authorize the issue of subpoenas for deposition without the concurrence of the ranking minority member or the committee. On page 2 in line 5, after questions insert, but not more than one hour. On page 1 in line 8, strike except in extraordinary circumstances. On page 1 in line 10, strike except in extraordinary circumstances. On page 1 in line 16, strike committee. On page 2 in line 2, strike committee. Uh, the gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes to speak on his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This amendment simply amends the chairman's proposal with the exact language the Republican majority, led by former Congressman Klinger, proposed and adopted last year. This language provides that subpoenas for depositions will only be approved with the concurrence of the minority or a vote of the committee. For the past two months, the chairman has been issuing subpoenas for documents. And let me describe how this process has worked. When the chairman's staff wants a document issued, they urge the chairman to do so. When he agrees, the minority receives 24 hours notice that a subpoena will be issued. We can object if the chairman, uh, if uh, we could object to the chairman if we disagree. But if he disagrees with our objections, the subpoena is issued nonetheless. That's why Craig Livingstone, who has nothing to do with this year's investigation, was issued a subpoena. And it's why the bank records of a history professor with an Asian name were subpoenaed, despite the fact that he had done nothing wrong and is not even remotely involved in this committee's investigation. Under the current rules, the majority never has to justify or make any public demonstration of the need for specific subpoenas. There are no institutional restraints of any kind. When the minority wants a subpoena issued, we're required to make a request to the chairman. And we appreciate the chairman's decision to have issued nine out of our 38 subpoenas. But when the chairman says no, as he did for the minority's Haley Barber subpoena, that's the end of the process. We can't come and argue in a public forum to our colleagues on this committee why such a subpoena should be issued. Notwithstanding the fact that we now know, according to the former president of the National Policy Forum, that Haley Barber had a, quote, fascination, end quote, with foreign money. We have no opportunity to appeal the chairman's decision and debate it with all the committee members. In short, the committee has delegated all authority to the chairman and his staff. This is completely unprecedented. When we debated this issue in April, the chairman could only cite four instances where a previous chairman of any committee unilaterally issued subpoenas for documents. That president was Chairman Klinger in 1996. But there is not a single example of a chairman ever unilaterally issuing a subpoena for depositions. Now, a subpoena for a deposition is different than a subpoena for documents, because you're subpoenaing the person to come forward. And that is a tremendously intrusive uh, uh, invasion, because we're causing a person serious disruption in their life. The individual must retain an attorney at considerable cost, spend hours preparing for the deposition, in many cases traveling to Washington for that deposition, providing testimony they might otherwise not disclose for personal reasons, and take time off from work to testify. For this reason, no member until now has ever actually issued a deposition subpoena unilaterally. Requiring the concurrence of the ranking minority member or a vote of the committee ensures that subpoenas will only be issued in the most compelling circumstances. Now, the chairman argues that the language he's proposing is the same language Representative Lee Hamilton followed in two previous investigations. But Representative Hamilton has informed us that he never issued a subpoena unilaterally, and that he interpreted consultation to mean that all decisions would be made on a bipartisan basis. 
the minority wouldn't have a problem today if Chairman Burton committed to following that interpretation. Instead, the chairman has made it clear that he wants to use the Hamilton wording, but not the Hamilton meaning. That doesn't wash here any more than it did when military dictatorships called their regimes democracies, but provided no democratic safeguards. Actions matter more than semantics. We have three choices we can make with regard to these depositions. And no one's arguing that, in many cases, depositions would be appropriate and necessary. We could uh, do what's sensible and proceed on the basis of what has been the policy of this committee when uh, Chairman Klinger was chairman last year and follow that president for concurrence or vote of the committee. Or we can go outside of our committee's precedent and look around for precedents elsewhere. And the only precedent elsewhere is the Hamilton precedent, where he told us how he followed it. Or we can take the Hamilton language but not have it uh, 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 apply in uh, the way that uh, he intended. But what we ought to do to be fair is to follow the procedure that is, un that is the usual one. This is a dramatic, and unprecedented, grant of power to one person. And when you give any one person that kind of power, it is possible to be abused and there are no checks on him. And then if he turns it over to his staff to conduct an investigation hour after hour after hour, it, they're paid for by the government, but the witness who has to subject himself to that deposition does so at his own expense and with the invasion of his own privacy. Government should be only intrusive when necessary, and what we're doing is providing for government intrusion when it may not be necessary but could be used for harassing purposes. I urge we adopt the Kinjorski Amendment. Uh, we'll get to you just a minute, Mr. Kinjorski. Uh, the authority was granted to Mr. Hamilton in the Iran-Contra and the October Surprise investigations, and the language that we are using is almost identical. We're asking for the same authority and not a bit more. Now, Mr. Hamilton's interpretation of that is Mr. Hamilton's interpretation. But the fact of the matter is, the rules were written very clearly, and we're using the same identical rules and procedures that were used in those two investigations. Our committee rule will be like that of Iran-Contra and that investigation, the October Surprise investigation, and Watergate, whereby we will consult with the minority prior to issuing any subpoenas for depositions and provide three business days notice before scheduling any depositions, and I believe that's more than was allowed under Mr. Hamilton. The minority will be fully informed of all depositions before they occur. We will consult with the minority on the witnesses and hope that we will not have to issue subpoenas to the witnesses. And I want to tell you, one of the reasons Mr. Hamilton did not have to issue subpoenas was because he had the authority. Once you have the authority, they know they're going to have to come before the committee, and so they don't wait for a subpoena. They say, well, if I'm going to have to go anyhow, I'll just go voluntarily. That makes it a little easier on anybody. But make no mistake about it, it was because Mr. Hamilton had the authority that they voluntarily came forward. I would anticipate that most witnesses will agree to the deposition under oath because we will have been authorized to take depositions. That was the experience of this committee in the last Congress. The authority outlined in the proposed resolution is consistent with the authorities, as I said before, previously granted to another Indiana chairman, Mr. Hamilton. Lee had the benefit of a cooperative minority which I also hope we will have. All we want to do is get to the bottom of this, the entire investigation. We intend to get that job done. We will not be deterred. We will confer with the minority, as we have been doing in the past. They will get adequate notice of depositions, and we'll confer with them before we even send somebody a subpoena or a request for deposition. And uh, beyond that, I don't think uh, I want to make any other comments, and I will now uh, yield to Mr. Kinjorski. Mr. Chairman, of course we can go on with a lot of arguments as to what the past was. I, I would like to define what we're arguing about so the American people listening to this actually know. 
We are not in any way, if the majority concurs with the minority in our amendment, limiting the majority's ability to subpoena, to hold depositions, and to act, even if everyone on the minority side objects to it. It is only a process where before the subpoena can be issued, a request and information must be made to the ranking member as a representative or agent of the minority in th for three days. If there isn't concurrence by Mr. Waxman, then the majority merely has the majority vote on the committee to issue the subpoena and all the powers of the chair that would rest under the language of the chair exist under those circumstances. There, so there's no limitation. Now, there are words in arguing the Hamilton language and the Klinger language of the 104th Congress, the difference between consultation and concurrence. We're not asking for concurrence as the final result. We're saying concurrence for a short period of time. If concurrence isn't had, so it's like consultation, the committee has to pass on. Now, why do we ask that? You may ask, well, what's so great about two words, concurrence, consultation, and if these two learned members of our committee, both representing the chairman and representing the majority, and Mr. Waxman representing the minority, if they can't concur, why can't just the majority issue that, uh, or the chairman issue that subpoena? Why should he have to go back to the House, or go back to the committee, and therefore get the support of the majority? For a very simple reason. Already in this hearing, we have seen a subpoena issued to Dr. Wang by mistake. Wrong Dr. Wang. What did that do for the wrong Dr. Wang? It embarrassed him. It cost him money to get a lawyer to find out what was wrong. People received his documents, his bank accounts, his privacy was invaded. American that had done nothing involved in this whole process was not involved, is not involved now, because he had the name Dr. Wang, he got nailed. That would not have happened if the chairman had asked concurrence with the minority ranking member. And if, if, if Mr. Waxman w would have picked that up, he could have informed the chairman that this is the wrong Mr. Wang, Mr. Wang would have been saved. Say Mr. Wang, Mr. Waxman didn't have the time to address it, passed it on or his staff didn't attend to it or they didn't know anything but he refused in blanket to authorize that subpoena. The chairman would come to the full committee and ask his majority to issue that subpoena and in that time Mr. Wang would have known that this professor at Georgetown wasn't the right Mr. Wang. He could have called up the chairman. He could have called up the staff. He could have called up a minority of the committee. He could have called up the Washington Post and said, I'm the wrong Wang. That would have been a headline, the wrong Wang. It's not really that funny, though. To Mr. Wang, to him, who, and he's a naturalized citizen of the United States, a great intellect, a great contributor to America, he had never thought in his wildest dreams that his constitutional rights of privacy as an American citizen could be so easily put aside without even an apology as to my understanding from this committee that that error was made. Now we can avoid those errors. We can avoid those errors and not restrict in any way the chairman or the majority of this committee to subpoena anyone they wish. And let it be very clear because in some of the discussions earlier it hasn't been. This member of the minority, and I think the majority of the minority, want to have this committee to have the power to subpoena people for depositions. There isn't any dispute on that. The only thing we want is the protection so that the wrong person or that the subpoena is not exercised unilaterally by the chairman alone, but that there is a process hoping that that will protect the constitutional rights of the individuals that will be called and there will be proper notice and at least mistakes won't be had and perhaps high expense to non-implicated American citizens occur. And when we're talking about calling hundreds of American citizens, exercising the most extreme sovereign power the Constitution gives anyone in this democracy, we ought to at least ask for concurrence. And if they can't concur, that the committee as a whole, more than the chairman, 
filter this process through because every individual that receives one of these subpoenas is going to have to expend twenty thirty forty fifty thousand dollars of their own money just to get the advice to defend the subpoena that they're called upon to answer to never with the right of getting recompensated what a tremendous burden that is put on an innocent party who did nothing and was not a part of it but just unfortunately had the wrong name Dr. Wang. Mr. Chairman, I, want, I urge you earlier in my opening, this is a simple change that would take us in com, uh, uh, comportment in compliance with the Klinger Amendment. It would not burden you or restrict you in any way to subpoena any way you wish. It would mis merely give us a protective device here for input from the ranking member, and if the ranking member fails to act, that the committee has the same authority that you would exercise unilaterally. I think it would go a very long way to setting out a course of conduct that we truly could have a bipartisan hearing. I urge you to accept my amendment so that we may get on with this hearing and show a new approach to bipartisan here today, bipartisanship here today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Kanjorski. Uh, Mr. Cox. Mr. Chairman, I have uh, great respect for my colleague, Mr. Kanjorski, and I uh, have read carefully the amendment that he has written, uh, and I also listened carefully to his comments. His comments are directed to the need for and importance of consultation between the majority and the minority, which has been the tradition of this committee. Consultation on matters such as Mr. Wong uh, if the minority are in possession of information indicating who is the correct Mr. Wong, certainly would have helped to avoid uh, the kind of problem that we just heard described. And it's the reason that consultation must be a part of our rules. The amendment does not call for consultation. The amendment calls for concurrence. What is in well, the unamended the rules you? before us is in fact uh, a requirement not only of advanced consultation uh, and not only of the 24 hours that the ranking member referred to, but three days, three full days, and three business days, not three calendar days, uh, during which time these matters can be worked out with respect to any individual request for a deposition uh, or the issuance of any interrogatories. There is an enormous difference between consultation and concurrence. What concurrence means is simply this. If the minority does not go along, then the majority cannot take a deposition. Will the gentleman, will the gentleman yield on that point? Uh, I appreciate very much uh, the extended remarks that my colleague gave. Well, I am an, now Mr. Cox, to respond if you just them. yield for a second, maybe we could have a dialogue I would explaining appreciate them. being able to proceed uninterrupted. The difference between consultation, as I was preparing to say, uh, and concurrence is that if, recur if concurrence is required in our rules, uh, then the minority must go along or the chairman will be unable to issue the subpoena, even after the full consultation to which the minority is entitled. And the truth of the matter is that never, under democratic control of this Congress, of this House, and of this committee, has there been a time when the rules have permitted the minority to have such veto authority? There has well, the been no yield. such circumstance ever. The gentleman's incorrect. Would he yield? Uh, I will be pleased to yield uh, to my colleague in just a moment because it's very important that we have an understanding about this. Uh, the rules that the Democrats maintained when the Democrats were in charge of this committee did not give the minority veto authority. Uh, at all. What they did provide for was consultation. That consultation took place because there was a cooperative relationship between our ranking member, the minority member, uh, and the Democratic majority on the committee. It's very important that we try to have that kind of cooperation under precisely the same rules, not veto authority for the minority, but precisely the same rules uh, that the Democrats had when the Democrats were in the majority. Second, the ranking member said that uh, as evidence of the fact that the minority ought to have this veto power, uh, we see that Craig Livingstone was issued a subpoena. And I take it that if the minority had such veto power, they would have prevented us from issuing a subpoena to Craig Livingstone. 
Uh, Craig Livingston will the, gen will the gentleman yield very again? much a part of this investigation. Will the gentleman yield on, on Mr. Cra uh, the rules of the 104th the, Congress? The, 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 gentleman, the gentleman from California has the time. He has not yielded. I thank the chairman, and I would appreciate if we would be sufficiently polite to allow the majority uh, or any individual member the same time to speak as uh, the author of the amendment uh, was extended himself. Craig Livingstone is very much a part of this investigation. The National Security Council last year warned the President of the United States uh, that he ought to stay away from a fellow named Yogesh Gandhi. Uh, they said at the National Security Council that he was misrepresenting himself. Uh, Mr. Gandhi uh, had in mind uh, giving a $325,000 donation uh, to the President uh, and in fact uh, Craig Livingstone, after the NSC had warned against this, uh, involved himself, and Mr. Livingstone arranged for the president to meet with Yogesh Gandhi a few blocks away at the Sheraton in order for this contribution to be perfected, according to the Wall Street Journal. Now, I'm distressed to know that the ranking member would exercise Democratic veto authority over the issuance of a subpoena to Craig Livingstone uh, if uh, he were in a position not just to consult, uh, but to uh, interfere with uh, the issuance of these subpoenas. The truth is that minority concurrence, that is, the minority must go along, even though the majority votes to issue a subpoena, would wreak utter havoc with what we're doing here. We would have this kind of contentious discussion and debate every time we wanted to issue interrogatories to a single individual. And let me say, on the subject of the great burden of responding to uh, a subpoena, or appearing at a deposition, or responding to interrogatories. Where were you when we discussed civil justice reform on the floor of the House of Representatives? Because the truth is that any of us who get sued by our neighbor for a slip and fall, any of us who get sued in a business dispute, any of us who get sued in any civil court, state or federal in the United States of America, can be made in law by anybody who has the money to pay a filing fee to sue us, to respond to a subpoena or to have our deposition taken. It can be our worst business competitor, uh, our worst personal enemy uh, who wants to take our deposition and we have to show up. Uh, that's what civil justice reform is aimed at, trying to protect people's uh, rights to not have to spend their treasure and their time and uh, uh, their jobs and so on uh, responding to depositions and uh, subpoenas. But the fact that Anybody that files a civil suit in America against Craig Livingstone can take his deposition doesn't seem to register. This Congress, the United States, trying to get to the bottom of serious matters is told we can't take his deposition, and I find that deeply offensive. I think this is a very destructive amendment. We would be insane to approve it, and uh, with all respect to its author, uh, I, I, I think uh, it should be withdrawn. Will the gentleman yield? Uh, the gentleman, gentleman, gentleman yield? You, does the gentleman conclude? I'd be happy to yield. Uh, Mr. Cox, well, the, uh, the gentleman's time has expired, and, and we'll try to get some additional time for you at the future. Uh, Mr. Lantos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to make a point uh, concerning Mr. Cox's statement, then yield to Mr. Waxman. Um, with all due respect, um, your earlier statement that concurrence by the minority was never the case May I advise you uh, in friendship that during the course of the extensive HUD investigations, every single subpoena issued by my subcommittee and by me as chairman was concurred in by the ranking Republican minority member. Now, that does not obligate all committees subsequently to use that procedure. But for the sake of the accuracy of the record, Mr. Cox, I am stating that every single subpoena issued by the HUD investigating subcommittee was fully concurred in by the ranking minority member prior to the issuance of, of the subpoena. I would, uh, first, I will yield to my friend, uh, uh, Mr. Waxman, then I'll be happy to yield to you. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Cox, said it would be unprecedented to have such a rule. Well, we have such a rule. This was a rule in our committee in the last Congress. It said that the chairman shall not authorize and issue a subpoena for a deposition without the concurrence of the ranking minority member of the committee. 
and all the members who were in this committee last time uh, in the last uh, two years voted for that rule. Now, we've heard that this is unprecedented. Let me read the rule from the Watergate uh, uh, investigation. It said, authority may be exercised by the chairman and the ranking minority member acting jointly, or if either declines to act, by the other acting alone, except that in the event either so declines, either ha shall have the right to refer to the committee for the decision. Whitewater. Uh, Whitewater rule said to issue subpoenas or orders for the attendance of witnesses or for the production of documents or physical evidence. A subpoena may be authorized by the special committee by the chairman with the agreement of the ranking member. Now, this is not a veto. If the chairman wants to issue a subpoena to someone, Mr. Huang, Huang or any of these other characters, I'd have no reason to object to it. If I had a reason to object to it, I'd give him that reason. If he didn't think it was a good enough reason, he could call the members together in the committee, and if I didn't have a good reason to, to go along with the subpoena, uh, I would look like I was being partisan if it was for only for that purpose. Uh, the chairman said he wants to work with us jointly, but he accuses, of being, accuses us of being partisan before he has any example or evidence of such a thing. The only partisanship we have seen is that they don't want the minority to have the rights that minorities have always had in every other investigative committee. The chairman, on the other hand, may want to issue a subpoena, and we think it's completely out of line. Well, he shouldn't be the last say on it. We ought to be able to make our case in public to the members of the committee as well. He could do it if we disagreed. We could do it if he disagreed. And then the issue is out before the public. And if we have a flimsy argument on our side or he has a flimsy argument on his side, then everybody will see what's going on, that there's some resistance to a subpoena without a good argument to back it up. Mr. Hamilton wrote to us, that while the language said that uh, the chairman will issue the subpoenas with the uh, consultation of the minority, they never issued a subpoena without concurrence and agreement. There should be no disagreement if it's, a, it's, if it's a material witness that has to do with the investigation being brought in to be subpoenaed. Chairman said if we had a subpoena that we can issue, people would respond, fine. But if they don't respond, let's make sure that we work together I just think that the, uh, you can stretch for arguments all you want. What is being unprecedented is the idea that the committee shouldn't have a chance to revisit the issue if either the chairman or the ranking minority member has a disagreement as to whether the subpoena makes sense or not. And I thank the gentleman from California for you. I promise Shall to I? yield to Mr. Cox first. Uh, Mr. Cox, I'm happy to yield to you. I thank the gentleman from California, uh, and I hope that we're not speaking past each other, but the gentleman cited his own experience on the HUD investigation in which the practice was that there was agreement between the majority and the minority prior to the issuance of uh, subpoenas. That's correct. Uh, what I said, and which uh, is very, very different, is that there is no example when the Democrats were in the majority when the minority had any authority under the rules to veto the issuance of subpoenas. Well, uh, since and, and is, if I may, reclaim, if I may reclaim my time, and since Mr. Shays is now in the room, and I trust his memory, I would like to direct a question to my friend, Mr. Shays. May I have your, uh, do I have your attention? I, I just caution the gentleman that he may not like the answer, so he may not want to ask the question. I, I will be happy to ask the question and take my chances on the answer. Uh, to your best recollection, did I as chairman ever issue a subpoena without your concurrence? Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, after I had gained your trust uh, and we had um, motions for subpoena. I was very happy to vote for those subpoenas. In fact, I encourage you to issue a number of them. So the answer is every single subpoena issued by me as chairman during our joint tenure on that subcommittee had your concurrence. Well, only, but only I would say this to you, uh, Tom. Uh, I think it's an irrelevant analogy because I was so willing to go after Republicans that you had to kind of keep me away from wanting to issue more subpoenas. 
Uh, and I don't ever remember us ever issuing a subpoena against a Democrat. I don't ever remember us calling a member before our committee who was a Democrat. I only remember us going after Republicans. Uh, if, I may, if I may further refresh your memory, Chris, our investigation related to the Department of Housing and Urban Development under a Republican administration. Under a Republican administration, there were no high-ranking officials who were Democrats in a Republican HUD. Well, the gentleman yield. No, I'd, like I'd, I'd like to respond. I'd like to respond. The gentleman's that, time has, has expired. Gentleman's I'd like to claim time, time then, Mr. Hastert. Uh, I just want to say very briefly. I, I would look at it two parts of this amendment. I think we, we're talking about the amendment and uh, the debates going on in recollection, recollections of years past. But if we look at the amendment first, uh, one of the things in the depositions, it says basically in this amendment that you can't depose somebody for more than an hour. Well, I look if, at this, if the gentleman you yield. I will not yield. I'm, I'm reading it says the question is, sir, but you're not, not more reading than one the hour. entire amendment in context. And the gentleman has the time. I would like to go on and say, you know, we've uh, debated here whether we should even go and move to the amendments. Uh, well, I don't know what time we exactly started, but I know we've been here for two or three hours. So to limit something for more than not, not more than one hour certainly would be remiss, I think. And then some very flexible language. I would say use a kind uh, term, flexible language, uh, on page one, line eight, and page one, line ten. It says, except in extraordinary circumstances, striking that out. So when, for instance, this Congress may be uh, recessed, and uh, after uh, consultation, uh, and we can't get everybody together, but it's a timely process that we do uh, ask for a subpoena and depositions, uh, that we can't do it. This amendment prohibits us from being able to do that. Now, I'm not an attorney. But I think there's some common sense. Well, well, I, I, I don't know what the gentleman's I will not yield. We restate oh, it? The gentleman uh, from Illinois has a time. And uh, I, I just think we need to, to look at the common sense part of this thing. We need to get a job done. Uh, we need to move forward. And this, uh, ta uh, these, this you know, amendment is a blocking amendment. Would the gentleman yield? I would be happy to yield from the gentleman from California. Uh, the discussion that's proceeded has uh, rather generously mixed up practice on the one hand with what the rules say on the other hand. And it is important to note, and I will repeat this once again, that there is no example when the Democrats were in the majority, when the minority had any authority under the rules to veto the issuance of subpoenas or uh, to prevent the taking of a deposition or the uh, sending transmission of interrogatories. The ranking member very cleverly read from rules from the Republican Congress, which is the only time uh, that I know of in the history of this committee uh, when there was any other arrangement. Uh, and what we are finding is that Chris. the level of obstruction of what we're trying to do here uh, is sufficient that to grant a veto power, uh, the only way around which would be to have uh, this kind the of proceeding you. every time we wanted to uh, uh, issue a subpoena to Craig Livingstone, for example, who, you know, it strikes me as, as uh, transparently obvious, ought to receive a subpoena, uh, that uh, we would be put to that trouble uh, just to get the subpoena out there. We find ourselves months into this investigation having made uh, grossly insufficient progress, and I can find no good reason for deviation from the long-standing policy of this committee, and I should add other committees of the Congress uh, over decades. Uh, this authority that's being sought here is utterly routine, utterly normal, exactly the same as it's always been done, and what's missing and what is different is the level of cooperation between the majority and the minority. It ought to be that we can have mutual agreement on the issuance of uh, uh, requests for uh, deposition authority and so on. I hope that all of them are done in precisely the same fashion as they were done when we had uh, ranking member uh, uh, Mr. Shays and uh, Chairman Lantos working together. Uh, there is no reason that that cannot be so. It ought to be so. Uh, and the way to do that is precisely the way we did it in the HUD investigation, which is with the same rules, but with the right level of cooperation between Democrats and Republicans. And I yield back to my friend from Illinois. Well, the gentleman from Illinois, yield. 
Uh, gentlemen, I would yield to the chairman. I just want to point out that Mr. Cox is absolutely incorrect. The rules of our committee have said the chairman can issue subpoenas after consultation with the minority. But the practice under Jack Brooks and every Democrat had been to issue subpoenas only with the concurrence of the minority, ranking minority, or a vote of the committee. And the there gentleman has never, is trying there's to change never the been rules. an example. And I, and I defy the gentleman to ever give us an example where subpoenas were issued without that process. And that is not a veto. Con lack of concurrence is not a veto because the committee itself can then meet and, and vote the subpoena. With but what we're being told, time, uh, told is we can't even have the concurrence. Yield to the gentleman from California. Well, I thank the gentleman from Illinois. And once again, the ranking member, the gentleman from California, has made my point precisely. Uh, the rules when Jack Brooks was chairman did not prevent, permit uh, the minority, the Republicans in those days, uh, to have a veto. They did not require uh, concurrence, as you are attempting to change the rules here. Uh, but to the contrary, it was left to a matter of practice. And I submit, I think it should be uh, clear to people who are engaged in public policy for a living, uh, that if the rule does not grant the minority a veto, the minority is much more likely to be cooperative. Uh, but if the minority is granted a veto, then the minority is much more likely to be obstructionist. We have a great deal here to investigate, and it's much the better that we have cooperation. I yield back to the gentleman from Illinois. I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back to balance his time. Mr. Fatah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, the gentleman from California, for throughout the dialogue here, seems to be confusing a couple of things, and I assume that it's not purposeful. Uh, and I'm certain it's not purposeful. There's no veto that's being sought here. It would only require the concurrence, in absent the concurrence, a vote of the majority of the committee. So to continue to insert the word veto, and, and you also stated that we are obstructing the investigation, uh, and I don't believe there's any evidence that there's been any obstruction of this investigation by anyone on this side of the aisle. And if you'd like to point that out, you can or you could clear up the record, because I think that allegation uh, does a disservice to those who serve on this side of the aisle. The issue here is what we would like is the Klinger rules. I served on this committee last session. The Klinger committee had a rule that said we would have concurrence. Now, we don't even need that. If the chairman would just stand up and say, look, I'm going to work with the ranking member. There's going to be concurrence, even though the rules will state differently, then we could probably move on. But the, since the practice has always been that there was concurrence with the minority, that was the practice under the Democrats. It was even it was the rule in the practice under the Republicans. There's no reason in this investigation for the rule to state that it's not going to be the practice and for there to be no assertion from the chairman that even though the rule might state that that is the, the, the rights of the majority, that he is, however, going to live within the precedents. So there's no reason to confuse these issues. We're not seeking a veto on the majority's right to subpoena anyone. What we're seeking is a right to have concurrence, absent that concurrence, to have a vote of the majority so that the chairman's actions on issuing subpoenas have the uh, sanction of an actual vote of the committee. Well, the gentleman yield I'd to be glad to yield you know, to uh, the gentleman, Mr. Wagner. I think there's some confusion, and I have to plead guilty to it. Because we've been talking about the rules that have been on the books for our committee where it says that concurrence, where it says the chairman will issue uh, with con a consultation, but the practice has always been concurrence. But the only time we have ever, since 1970 anyway, ha issued subpoenas for depositions, which is a lot different than just subpoenas for records, the only time we ever did that was in the last Congress under the, under the Klinger chairmanship. That was the only time we ever asked for deposition uh, authority for individuals to be brought in to answer questions under oath. And under that single time our committee undertook depositions, Chairman Klinger offered a rule that said there would be concurrence with the minority or a vote of the committee. All we're asking with this amendment is to follow the only precedent we've ever had in this committee, which was offered by a Republican chairman and agreed to by all of us on a bipartisan basis. And I don't see why the Republicans wouldn't support that position, which many of them who were on this committee last year voted for. I thank you for you. Uh, 
Um, the gentleman I'd be glad yield. to yield to the gentleman from uh, Florida. Thank you for yielding. Well, I just want to remind my colleagues that we've been there and we've done that. And we had the Klinger uh, procedures, we had the Klinger rules in place. What I submit we never had was people fleeing the country like, uh, well, the like we yield. have here. Claim my time. We never had well, the people yield. who... Claim my time. Uh, I, I don't mind we, yielding to you, and we, but we have nothing to do with those people fleeing the country. Well, what we're asking yield. for is just a fairness with inside the rules. I'll be glad to continue to yield. And, and I think that uh, what you asked for is also uh, uh, in, in the spirit of fairness, and we want to cooperate. But in practice, we've seen that we were... Uh, again, delayed, stonewalled uh, by the White House and by others, even in, in this investigation. Reclaiming my time. Well, the to gentleman date, from Pennsylvania yield. To date, we've not been able to get Excuse records. Excuse me, reclaiming my time. Mr. Fatah. I understand the frustrations that accompany an investigation. There's no one on the minority side in this committee that's responsible for any of that. What we're talking about is our rights as a minority in the committee, either in the rule or th some, from an insertion from the chairman which all of us would honor, I assume, because I, he's, a, he's, a, he's a gentleman and a man of his word. So we're not, don't blame us for people being in, in China somewhere. We're talking about, let's get, you know, I mean, the selective amnesia, what the rules were, what the precedents were. What we want is some basic fairness so that the investigation well, can go forward. In the Senate, the gentleman every gone. subpoena issued by the Senate in this investigation has been concurred in by both sides. There's no reason, even though we're on the other side of the Capitol, for us to act as if we can't find some basis in which to proceed forward. Well, I'd like to yield some of my time to the gentleman, Mr. Ken, with the Ken gentleman Gorski yield. from Pennsylvania. Okay. Mr. Chairman, trying to direct this back, I would like to get the response. Mr. Cox, uh, I think, uh, uh, without malicious intent, injected the word veto in here. And I'd like to very clear that. This is no veto. The, the ranking member can't stop the issuance of a subpoena. The only thing the ranking member can do under my amendment or under the prior Klinger rules is to not concur, which would require then the committee to consider it. And since the chairman is elected by a majority of the committee, it is presumed that the majority would stand with the chairman if they thought his request for the subpoena would be correct. So there is no veto here. The minority is not asking the right to stop people from being heard. The gentleman yield. Uh, well, in courtesy, yes, you would yield to me, yield. but I will yield to you, Mr. It's Cox. not his time to yield. Uh, as I'd recall, be glad I, to yield I did to you, yield. Uh, uh, if uh, Mr. Uh, Fatal will I, yield, I'll... I, th I thank the gentleman. Uh, I think the reason that my colleague from Florida raises the question of people fleeing the country is that when you've got uh, uh, people no, fleeing, no, when you've got people fleeing you know the what? country. Mr. Fatal, could you withdraw your... We're not into that debate, uh, Mr. Cox. I yielded the time. Uh, yeah. with, I, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you for letting me complete my sentence. Uh, if you've got to take somebody's deposition because there's a risk of flight, uh, if you've got to convene a meeting like this to discuss it and vote on it, and time is of the essence, uh, it's in all likelihood going to be a, a grave problem. The, the truth is the that this is an illustration of how difficult it time. is to get a vote through this. Reclaiming my time, oh, and course. the chairman knows I'm running out of time. Uh, uh, in extraordinary circumstances, I would assume, I'm certain that we would agree that we wouldn't have to go through these procedures. But under a normal process, there should be respect for the minority. And you, as someone who served both in the minority and in the majority, should not, you know, just a few years removed from being in the minority, you know, just want to proceed in a fashion that has no respect for minority rights. These are your rules from your majority. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, there's a certain Alice in Wonderland quality to what we're doing here today. If I understand it correctly, the majority is doing an excellent job of arguing against the rule that they supported last session. Is, maybe I'll ask, is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Is this, this is the rule we had last session that you and others are eloquently arguing is a, is a brutally unfair rule? Uh, is the gentleman asking me a question? Yes. This investigation transcends greatly the previous investigation. Therefore, I'm not talking we, about the investigation. I'm talking I'll, about I'll the rule. You, I'll answer your question. Therefore, we feel it necessary to have the authority that was granted during the Iran-Contra investigation. I'll reclaim my time, Mr. Chairman. I'll reclaim my time because my question was aimed at the rule. And if the rule was a good rule last session, then it stands to reason that it's a good rule this session. The only thing that has changed is the chairmanship of this committee. 
Mr. Mr. Klinger thought it was a good rule. The majority thought it was a good rule. It was adopted by the majority members on this on that side last session. I wish I could have the transcripts of, of today's arguments against last year's rule, and we could maybe get in a time machine and we could use some of those eloquent arguments against it. But I think Mr. Shays, in his comments, when when Mr. Lantos was asking him a question, really got to the heart of the matter here today. And what he said was, yes, after Mr. Shays earned the trust of Mr. Lantos, there was concurrence on all, on all the uh, subpoenas that were granted. Trust was a factor there. And I think the American people want a little trust and they want a little fairness in these proceedings. And I think Will my colleague yield for just a second? Be, I'd be happy to yield. Uh, Mr. Shea certainly earned my trust, but there was no period of time during which I issued subpoenas on a unilateral basis. And I, and I, and I so think, he earned my trust mighty fast. And I think that the reason for that was because there was mutual trust. And if there's anything that's, that's missing on this community, it's mutual trust. And you gain mutual trust by treating people in the minority fairly. And that's what has been missing from this debate is that there has not been a fair treatment. As much as the people on this side of the aisle, the Democrats, would like us to go after Republicans, I know the reality. I know what's going on here. You're going to be going after Democrats, just as Mr. Shays knew the reality when he was a ranking member a, a decade ago. The reality was that the Democrats were going to go after Republicans. The reality today is Republicans are going to go after Democrats. That doesn't mean you can't do it in a, in a trusting situation. And so if we had a rule last session, and again, this is what boggles my mind, we had a rule last session that the majority liked. And now this year, all of a sudden, it's too much. It's too much to ask concurrence. And again, I harbor no illusions that if it came to a vote, that the majority would override the wishes of the minority. You've got the votes. You can do it. One other point, because my friend Mr. Haster from Illinois accused Mr. Kanjorski of trying to cut off depositions after an hour. That's the furthest thing from the truth. What Mr. Kanjorski's amendment says and what my subsequent amendment says is that each round will last no longer than an hour. There can be numerous rounds, but our point is that you should not have a minority staff person asking questions for two, three, four days while an elected Democratic member of Congress has no right to ask a question. And that's the way these rules are drafted. A staff person from the Republican side has far greater rights than any elected member from Congress who just happens to be a Democrat. And I yield back the balance of my time. I, I would yield, excuse me, I would yield to Ms. Maloney. I thank my colleague for yielding, and I, I would really like to speak in support of Kanjorski's statements and Mr. Barrett's, and I'd like to put in the record the language of the Klinger Amendment, and also a letter that he uh, wrote to Mrs. Uh, Cardis Collins, and I'd like to put that letter in the record, and I'd like to quote from a small portion of, of it. Mr. Klinger, the Republican former chair, said, and I quote, I shall not authorize such subpoenas without your concurrence or the vote of the committee. I believe that this rule memorializes the long-standing practice of this committee to seek a consensus on the issuance of a subpoena. Now, there's been much talk about precedent. I'd like to put in the record a, 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 a piece of paper or a, 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 a whole outline of what has happened previously that was prepared by the, the minority staff, but it's the history of the deposition authority in the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight. 92nd uh, Congress, a deposition authority, no. 93rd Congress, no. 94th Congress, no. 95th Congress, no. 96th Congress, no. 97th Congress, no. 98th, 99th, 100th, no. 101, no. 102, 103, no. Then in the 104th Congress, they, they uh, had the authority, but they did not do it, uh, the, the authority without uh, the concurrence of, of the minority. And, and uh, I just uh, feel that uh, there's been a lot of talk, but there's just, uh, we need to get the record straight on this. And then the issuance of unilateral uh, deposition subpoenas in major House and Senate investigations. Again, I'd like to have this chart put in the record, and it goes through every single investigation that has ever taken place 
in the history of the House of Representatives, and they have never issued a unilateral deposition. But now with the Gingrich-Burton investigation, they want to change the rules, and uh, I, I feel that uh, it's, it's time to go back uh, to democracy and to Mr. Klinger's language, which Mr. Konjorski has, has put before this body, and we should support the Republican Klinger Konjorski amendment. Gentleman's time, gentleman's time has expired. Gentlemen. Did you want some time? No. Mr. Owen. Gentlemen, I yield my time to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Konjorski. Thank you very much, Mr. Owen. Mr. Chairman, we, we're coming down to uh, a decision that's going to affect the process we go through, the constitutional rights and the privacy of hundreds of Americans, the responsiveness and cooperation between the majority and the minority side. And it's all going to revolve around, it seems to me, and I hope not, but it seems to me, egos. And that is whether or not the majority can take one step back, examine my amendment as offered, and I assure you it's offered in the intention of good faith. It merely allows that the chairman shall not authorize or issue a subpoena for the deposition without the concurrence of the ranking member or the committee. There is no veto. There is a slight delay. I certainly think if, if the majority side is aware of flight to attempt the response to this committee, we can find the language to authorize emergency, extraordinary circumstance issuance of subpoenas. There is not a member of the minority that would want anyone to escape the jurisdiction of this Congress by merely leaving our jurisdiction. But on the other hand, what we're asking for is a process that would create an atmosphere of bipartisanship that has occurred on and on. And I was here in the 104th Congress. We had some very contentious hearings in travel gate, file gate, and every other gate that we could invent. But in reality, we had every witness that we wanted, every deposition taken. There wasn't a denial or an, an ability on the minority side to exercise any veto under any deposition that wanted to be taken by the majority. It was accomplished to an end where a report was filed, not a report that had the concurrence of the minority, but nevertheless a report. In this instance, if we were to adopt this rule that is requested by the majority, it is the most extreme exercise of authority by a single member of the Congress in the role of a chairman of a committee that will ever existed in the precedence of the Congress of the United States, I question whether it is even constitutional for that exercise of power to occur, but that's for another day. Why do we have to go to the extreme? Why do we have to use those emotional words like veto when in fact there is no veto? Why not recognize what we're saying? that if 100 or 200 subpoenas for depositions have, have to be issued, if the proper identification is made to the ranking member, he, by as an elected official and held to public ridicule if he abuses office, would have to either, after that consultation, concur or send it to the committee, and the full disclosure of, of his wrongful acts, if they were thought to be wrongful, would be made to the general public. And clearly the chair would have the authority of the majority vote of the committee so the subpoena would be issued. Where would we lose time? Where is there any greater hammer over the head of any individual in America that if you said that if you do not appear voluntarily before my committee, I will ask for a, a, a subpoena, and if not incurred upon, the majority of the committee will vote for me to issue that subpoena within three days. How does that in any way vitiate the authority of the chair? But on the other hand, looking at the positive side of what can happen on this amendment today, rather than having the minority feel that it is being brutalized by the rules, that it is not part of the investigation, that this is not an intention to get at facts or circumstances, that 
conceitably will be more embarrassing to the minority than to the majority. We know that. Why not take this opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to show what you have expressed in the press in the last two months, that truly your crit critics will be disappointed in that you intend to carry out a fair, impartial, bipartisan hearing. I do truly believe you would like to do that. This is probably the highlight of the moment in this investigation to prove that fairness of process. And so that anyone listening to my words is clear, this will not inhibit the, the chairman or the majority or this committee from deposing any witness they wish to depose. It will not provide a veto or any requirement that the minority agree with the majority on anything because the committee will be run by the essence and the vote of the majority. But it will not disturb the long-term precedences of this committee because I think we're on a road in America today and in the Congress to start to think that partisan advantage may justify the invasion of privacy of individuals and maybe even tearing up their constitutional rights, which all of us was our first pledge as we took office to uphold this Constitution. How can we fail in not doing that by being reasonable and in accepting the amendment as offered to the chairman's rule and move on with this process, Mr. Chairman? I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Yell. The gentleman yields Mr. back the balance of his time. Uh, if Mr. Mr. Owens would yield. Mr. Allen? It's still his time, isn't it? Uh, yes, time is the gentleman has a point of order. Oh, no, I'm sorry, the time expired? Time expired. Oh. His time had expired. Mr. Allen? Mr. Allen's not here. Do it. Does anyone else seek time? My, it's me, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Allen and I Mr. share. Ford, I'm sorry. Yes, I just have one question, and I, I rise in support of Mr. Kondrowski's amendment. But I would ask Mr. Cox, I was not here last Congress, and I would even ask Mr. Chairman to explain to us freshman members, and more importantly, explain to the American people, those watching, last Congress, uh, for the first time, uh, as the gentlelady from New York has explained, the 92nd through the 103rd, no deposition authority, if I'm reading correctly. The last Congress, you had deposition authority. However, no unilateral subpoenas for depositions were issued because, as Ms. Maloney has so kindly gone over, the language from Ms. Mr. Klinger to Ms. Collins regarding concurrence. Why is it, Mr. Cox and Mr. Chairman, that your position has changed? Perhaps you can explain it to me, my constituents, and even your constituents as to why now you want to have deposition authority, but you want to change the language with regard to seeking the concurrence of the minority. You've raised some issues with regard to emergency situations. I think Mr. Kondrowski has adequately and sufficiently addressed that, as well as other members on this side. But perhaps you can explain uh, your flip-flop on this issue, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Cox. Will the gentleman yield? Absolutely. I thank the gentleman, and I'd, I'd put the question to the gentleman why, if not the gentleman himself, since he's a new member, why... Uh, the minority side, having only recently acquired that status and no longer being in the majority, uh, has changed its position because uh, the rules that we are seeking to proceed under are the very rules that if, the majority If the gentleman, let me re reclaim for one moment, sir. Just for, it's your time, of course. Let me say, but this is language that Mr. Klinger and I believe your side proposed and accepted. So I appreciate your answer. I just wonder, hoping you can answer or respond along those lines. I appreciate wh what you're saying, but that is right. this is Klinger, Republican, proposal, Klinger, Republican, acceptance. Two years later, Mr. Cox, Mr. Chairman, Republicans reject. I'm just curious as to why the flip-flop. Uh, when Republicans were in the majority, that is the only time uh, in the history of this committee and the history of the House that the uh, word uh, concurrence was used in the rules, in other words, that the minority was given a veto. Uh, and in fact, as a result of that experience, uh, we are returning to the original majority rules of the House because uh, the FBI files matter, for example, we still haven't gotten any answers on. We did not enforce a single subpoena against the White House in the 104th Congress. I appreciate it. I yield to the gentleman from Philadelphia. Thank you. The gentleman, Mr. Cox, again stated that that was the only time the minority had a veto. Unless the English language is is a more imprecise tool than I think it is. It is clear that what concurrence means is not a veto. Now, Mr. Cox, you've asserted this for the sixth time today. 
and it is not a veto, it is a concurrence, that absent the concurrence is a vote of the, the majority. And I want to thank the gentleman from Tennessee for uh, yielding me time, because I think it's at least important, no matter how we're going to vote on this, that we at least put a, a, an appropriate clarification into the record as to what is being dealt with here. If the minority was seeking a veto, I'd voted against it myself, even as a member of the minority. No one on this side of the aisle is seeking one. Now, unless you're trying to give us one, maybe we could remove that description of what it is that is before us. With the gentleman, let me, the gentleman, let, let me, let me if, if one moment, I might say to Mr. Cox that the only precedent we have for this concurrence is two years ago, so the deposition authority is only two years old. I yield to, to Mr. Tierney for, for 30 seconds. Thank you. I just want to make a point. That that's true that the only language we were talking about is the language that the Republican majority put into place last time, but you made reference and others have made reference to the language of former times when Mr. Hamilton was chairman being similar to what you're proposing now, but we also know that he interpreted it to be in such a way that there would be concurrence or a vote of the majority. And I know Mr. Hamilton, I suspect everybody here probably knows him better. And frankly, we're not dealing here with Mr. Hamilton, and that's part of the problem. And if we were dealing with Mr. Hamilton, then we could trust that he would in fact, interpret the language for a concurrence or a vote of this committee. But that's not what we're going to get, and there is nothing that's happened so far in the six months that would encourage anybody to believe that we're going to get that kind of open and fair process or treatment. And Gentlemen, it is that, uh, that trust factor that leads us to believe that we would hope that you would go back to where you were in the last session. You were comfortable with it then. We can live with it this time. And that would make sure that you have the assurance and then you wouldn't have to worry or make up stories about people obstructing anything and there wouldn't have to be stories made up about vetoes or whatever. We can move forward on this under rules that you were very recently found acceptable. I yield, I yield to my ranking member, Mr. Waxman. The only time this committee ever took depositions and issued subpoenas for depositions of people was in the last Congress. We were in the minority. The Republicans were in the majority. Chairman Klinger, the Republican chairman, issued a rule that said explicitly that there would be concurrence with the minority. And Mr. Cox, the chairman, others who were here last Congress voted for that rule. What's changed? Why won't you vote for the same rule you had last time, which was the only precedent we ever had? And I'd, I'd like with to the to you. I reclaim my time. It's my time. I'll yield to you, Mr. Cox. I'd just ask the ranking member why he voted for the Iran Contra, uh, the Iran Contra language, which did not provide for such. Well, the gentleman's wrong. Iran Contra did, but our committee's president was last terms, no, last the, Congress, the Iran -Contra and we all the voted for it. Did not provide for concurrence. It did. You're wrong. It no, did. it did not, and I, I think we should. Uh, I reclaim my time. Let me. I reclaim my time and yield to. Iran Contra was Mr. consultation. If I could, maybe I could go through and and. Uh, go the gentleman's the correct. Iran Contra was consultation. Um, I have before me the, the summary of the past deposition authority in the House. As you, as you know, it, it's, the deposition authority has to be granted by the, by the House. It's not implicit in the House rules. Um, in, the, in the Bosnia uh, situation, which was in the 104th Congress, um, Mr. Hyde, consultation was required by the House, but no subpoenas were issued. The second one is the White House travel, again in the 104th Congress. Consultation was required by the House, but the committee rules required concurrence. Uh, in, in the 102nd Congress, under Congressman Hamilton, uh, for the October surprise, consultation was, requi was required, but the practice was concurrence. G gentleman's time has expired. I'm sorry, but... but uh, I would ask unanimous consent just to flesh out the record to go through these well, so that we can all be talking about the same thing. Ask all right, the gentleman will proceed, but I'm going to try to stick close to the clock from here on out. And I, I appreciate it. Again, I, all I want to do, because there's been charges go back ahead, and forth, go ahead, go ahead. to go through these. Um, the Judge Hastings impeachment in the 100th, 100th Congress, the resolution was silent on the issue, would use Nixon impeachment proceedings, but no subpoena was issued. The Judge, Nix, the Judge Nixon impeachment in the 100th Congress, the resolution was silent, would use Nixon impeachment proceedings, but no subpoena was issued. Number seven, the Select Committee on Assassinations mm -hmm. in the 95th Congress. Subpoenas may not be utilized for staff depositions. Number eight, gifts by Korean government to members of Congress, 1977, 95th Congress, joint or committee vote for subpoenas. And the Nixon impeachment, joint or committee vote for subpoenas. In other words, there has not been a time in the last 30 years since these rules have been in effect where there has been a committee that has issued subpoenas unilaterally, either through House rules or through committee rules. Gentlemen's Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I ask unanimous consent 
We have this entered in the record. Will be without objection. Reserving uh, the right to object. The gentleman reserves his right. To I object. reserve the right to object, and I, if uh, uh, if I may speak to that, uh, uh, I would be glad to withdraw my reservation if I'm granted unanimous uh, consent to submit into the record comparisons of. Uh, the Iran-Contra Rule 7.1 and the October Surprise Rule 7.1 and a list of the investigative uh, tools, this chart uh, which lists uh, the various uh, uh, processes, uh, subpoena processes, uh, deposition uh, and discovery processes uh, from previous uh, uh, investigations. Okay. Without objection, both will be entered into the record. Mr. Kucinich. Hey, gentlemen's mic is not on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, read into the record from the rules of the Committee on Government Over uh, Reform and Oversight, uh, the uh, March 1996 printing from the Government Printing Office. <clears throat> the following citation from Rule 19, Special Affidavits and Depositions, uh, the language uh, on subsection B as follows. Notwithstanding Committee Rule 18D, the Chairman shall not authorize and issue a subpoena for a deposition without the concurrence of the ranking minority member of the committee. Now that's the, uh, the substance of what we're talking about uh, with respect to Klinger and also with respect to Kanjorski. The um, proposal uh, before us uh, by the Chair, I would submit, proposes a radical rule, which is unprecedented, and I would hope that this committee would take a, a more conservative approach, which would be to follow the precedent. Uh, it was backed by the other side of the aisle in the last term, and throughout the last hour, in listening carefully to the discussion, I haven't uh, been able to hear any real complaint about uh, the inadequacy or failing of uh, that particular provision. And I think that uh, any effort on the part of this committee to overturn uh, that provision, which uh, worked in the last Congress, would have to be supported by some uh, facts as to why it uh, didn't work, uh, not why it couldn't work. Uh, the, the fact is, as a matter of record, that the Klinger rule, last year's rule, had concurrence, that no one has cited a single problem caused by that, that no one disputes that uh, such concurrence uh, was, in fact, workable. Uh, and I ask, isn't it therefore reasonable and precedent-setting to adopt the Klinger rule again? And that's exactly what the Kanjorski Amendment would do. Uh, furthermore, uh, it should be said that the precedent-backed Kanjorski Amendment which would provide for concurrence, in effect respects the role of the Congress. And that is that each individual in the Congress and each individual on a committee would have some say, or moreover, either as a, constituted as a committee or through our ranking minority member. Any attempt to delete that through not permitting Kanjorski's amendment would nullify the role of the minority participation in this committee. Furthermore, uh, with respect to the other provision of uh, the Kanjorski Amendment of uh, granting one hour to each side to ask their uh, questions, uh, that shows, his amendment shows a respect, again, for the role of a congressperson. Why should any member of Congress have to await uh, endless hours while staff uh, for either side would continue with questions? We, as members of this Congress, have a right to expect that we don't yield our role to anyone, on staff or otherwise. So, Mr. Chair, I would submit that the Chair already has the power, uh, as the Chair, to be able to manage the affairs of this uh, committee. The Chair has the votes. The Chair has the gavel. The Chair has the experience. And the Chair would be able to conduct the business of this committee, I believe, consistent with the rules that were in effect under Mr. Klinger,
consistent with the amendment which Mr. Kanjorski uh, seeks approval of. And I would urge the, uh, the Chair's uh, careful consideration of Mr. Kanjorski's amendment. Does the gentleman yield back the balance of his time? Yes. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Is there further discussion on the amendment? If not, if not, uh... if I could just add one more. Gentlelady ladies recognized. I, I, I just, uh, this has been very well debated on both sides, and, and it appears that uh, we have two choices. Uh, one is to stick with the precedent of this committee, the Klinger language, or if you want to go to the Hamilton language, then interpret it in the way that he interpreted it. And as I said earlier and put in the record in his statements um, to Mr. Hamilton said, as a matter of practice in the Iran-Contra and also in October Surprise, he did not issue a single deposition without the ranking member's concurrence. And I just would like to close with that. Thank you. Gentlelady yields back the balance for time. Is there further discussion? If not, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Pennsylvania. All those in favor will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Roll call vote. A roll call vote has been requested and will be granted. The clerk will call the roll. No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gilman? No. Mr. Gilman votes no. Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes no. Mrs. Morella? No. Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? No. Mr. Cox votes no. Ms. Ross Layton? No. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? No. Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Horn votes no. Mr. Micah? No. Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Davis from Virginia? No. Mr. Va Davis from Virginia votes no. Mr. McIntosh? No. Mr. McIntosh votes no. Mr. Souter? <coughs> Mr. Scarborough? No. Mr. Scarborough votes no. Mr. Shattuck? Mr. LaTourette? No. Mr. LaTourette votes no. Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sanford votes no. Mr. Sununu? No. Mr. Sununu votes no. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Sessions votes no. Mr. Pappas? No. Mr. Pappas votes no. Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Snowbarger votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Portman? No. Mr. Portman votes no. Mr. Waxman? Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Towns? Aye. Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski? Aye. Mr. Kanjorski votes aye. Mr. Condent? Mr. Condent votes aye. Mr. Sanders? Aye. Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Cummings? Yes. Mr. Cummings votes yes. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes aye. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Davis from Illinois? Aye. Mr. Davis from Illinois votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Aye. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Turner? Aye. Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Aye. Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Ford? Aye. Mr. Ford votes aye. Mr. Shays? No. Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Shattuck? No. Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. Wise? Aye. Mr. Wise votes aye. Mr. Fatah? Yeah. Mr. Fatah votes yes. Mr. Bogoyevich? Clerk will report the vote. Mr. Chairman, there are 19 ayes and 23 nays.
The amendment fails. Uh, are there further amendments? Chairman, I have an amendment. Gentlemen, will the clerk will report the amendment. I have no amendment at the desk. You do not have the amendment? No, I do. Hang on. Can you distribute the amendment to all the members? Insert a new paragraph after paragraph one as follows. The chairman and ranking member shall make a formal request to the chairman of the Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs to coordinate efforts to avoid duplication in the deposition pr process. If the Senate Committee accepts this request, the chairman shall consult with the Senate Committee on Governmental Affairs prior to deposing a witness that the Senate Committee has deposed or scheduled to depose. If after such cons consultation, the chairman seeks to depose such witness. A committee vote shall be required before a notice or subpoena is authorized or issued for the deposition of the witness. The chairman shall include the ranking minority member in any consulta consultations with the Senate committee and shall provide the ranking minority member with a copy of any deposition transcript obtained from the Senate committee. In turn, the chairman shall provide upon request to the Senate committee on governmental affairs a copy of any transcript of a deposition taken by the House committee. The gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes to discuss his amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, this amendment seeks to avoid duplication and save taxpayers money by directing us to coordinate our efforts with the Senate. The amendment requires the chairman and the ranking member to make a formal request to Senator Thompson's committee to make an effort to avoid duplication in the disposition process. If and only if the Senate committee complies with this request, then the amendment requires our committee to consult with Senator Thompson's committee before questioning a witness that has already been questioned there. It also requires that a copy of any transcript of disposition take, taken by the Senate committee be provided to us upon request. If after this consultation, the chairman chooses to dispose a witness already deposed in the Senate, a vote is required to be taken by the full committee here. In order to be fair and ensure coordination, we will be required to respond in kind by providing information gathered in our disposition with Senator Thompson's committee. Mr. Chairman, this committee is an attempt to try to uh, stop duplication of the two committees. It is an attempt to try to save money of the committee and the taxpayer. In addition to that, I believe it will save money by individuals and groups who are forced to come here and testify twice. Uh, it will also I think help us with the time effort uh, in uh, helping reduce time that it takes to do all the work that needs to be done. And I ask for support of this amendment, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, Mr. Hastert. Uh, I appreciate the gentleman from California bringing this amendment forward. I know his hard work and, uh, in a bipartisan way in trying to find ways to, to uh, constrain costs and to save money, especially for the taxpayers, and I uh, can salute him on being able to do that. However, upon looking at this amendment, I would raise a couple issues. Uh, this is predicated on the basis that if uh, the Senate were going to depose a person in the future, that the Senate would be constrained to share that deposition with us. Uh, we don't know what that deposition would be in the future. Uh, we don't know if the Senate uh, would share that information with us because it's perspective. And uh, there's nothing in here that constrains the Senate to give any information uh, to this body. So uh, prospectively, if we were uh, prohibited from asking or seeking to depose a witness who we think is important to our investigation, and in fact, because the Senate would in the future depose that person, uh, and the Senate really doesn't have the responsibility or we can't constrain the Senate from sharing that information. I think there's a flaw in this amendment which will certainly hamstring the House investigation and significantly restrict the ability uh, to get information. Uh, this limit on our ability to depose the witness in the Senate has uh, deposed or will depose in the future. Uh, I again, I think the uh, gentleman uh, is well-meaning I appreciate his efforts in trying to save uh, taxpayer dollars, but I think in this sense it, can, it gives a constraint in the House uh, depending on the possible or maybe impossible goodwill of the Senate to share information that they're not constrained to share. So I would ask for a no vote. 
I'd be happy to yield. Yes. Well, uh, I appreciate what you're saying. If you, if you look at the amendment, the amendment requires the chairman and ranking member to make a formal request to Senator Thompson's committee to, to avoid duplication in this process. I mean, that is a very reasonable thing for us to do, to have a visit with Senator Thompson. And you're telling me that, that Senator Thompson would not be amenable to try to work this out, understanding the time frame that we're working here and also the cost of, of both committees? If I, if I could reclaim my time and yes, answer sir. the question, uh, I'm not sure what Senator Thompson would be amenable to or not. I, I really can't answer that question. The second part of that is if we agree not to depose because of potential deposition of the Senate. Now, they are a group of people that have their own uh, agenda, uh, want to ask questions, and may have, they may be asking that uh, uh, person, uh, having to depose that person on a completely different plane uh, or series of issues that we may want to depose that person on. And I'm just saying to depend on the uh, Senate's deposition when we are constrained from not deposing that person uh, certainly would, I would think, inhibit that. Uh, I hope that there could be an agreement. I hope there could be agreement on a bipartisan basis and a by, uh, between the two houses of the Congress. But that's not always the case, and I think we should not be constrained, uh, especially on a future deposition, uh, if we don't know what the results of that deposition are. And what, Well, let me just finish my thought. And uh, if we don't know what the, the uh, future of that deposition is, what the uh, result of that deposition is and then be constrained from uh, deposing uh, that person. And I would continue to yield. Yeah, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't stop anyone from deposing uh, the witness, us or them. We, we only uh, ask that we don't duplicate. If they depose someone, they, they have a statement, they have records that we can uh, share with them, uh, then we don't duplicate that. But we can depose anyone we want. Uh, we can particularly depose anyone we want if the chairman wants to bring it here, even if they've deposed them already. But what we're trying to do is to try not to duplicate and do it twice. That seems to make total sense. And let me tell you, it makes total sense to the people out there uh, listening to this that we don't ask people to come up here twice, waste their time, waste money. And, and if they depose them, all we're doing is give us the transcript of that. We can use that in our proceedings here. And uh, it just makes total sense to do that. They can depose anyone they want. We can depose if anyone we want. If I could reclaim my time, I, I think the only probably fault with that thinking is if the uh, deposition is done in executive session, then I don't think that the Senate has the ability to share that information with us or uh, could do that legally. And I think that's a, a problem also, or vice versa. I yield back my time. Gentleman well, Mr. 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 Chairman, if, if that's the case, then they can say so. We cast a vote, and we, we depose that person. The gen gentleman yields and back. I can't, and I can't believe that they will not share the, the information with us. I think that's information that we would be entitled to. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Does anyone else see, see time? Gentleman Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I think Mr. Condit usual has come up with a, uh, an amendment that if people looked at it, um, say this is a good bipartisan amendment. That's Gary Condit's style. He tries to do things working fairly with both sides, and I think that this is another example of where he's trying to save the taxpayer dollars um, by, by coming up with a, this amendment. Um, I have to underscore the point that if Senator Thompson says no, then the deal's off. So, so there's nothing here that's going to require Senator Thompson to do anything. This rule would only kick into effect if Senator Thompson agrees with it. And the attempt here clearly is to save the taxpayer dollars. And I can't see why anybody would say, no, we don't want to do that. We just, we just want to keep spending the taxpayers' money on these depositions. There's another point here that I think has to be made. And for those of us who were on this committee last year, when we did the travel office investigation, and I will never, as long as I live, forget the five or six members of that office who sat there and who felt that their lives were destroyed because they were accused unjustly and they had to incur legal costs that we as a committee and Congress felt so strongly were unfair that we voted to pay for those committee, that we voted to pay for those legal costs because we felt that was unfair. Now what are we doing this year? This year we are giving the chairman the unilateral power to issue subpoenas to individuals whose major sin in life has been that they have contributed to the Democratic Party. 
Make no mistake about what's going on here. What's going on here is that this is campaign finance reform, Republican style. If you have given money to the Democrats, you are now open to have a unilateral subpoena issued to you. You have to hire an attorney. You have to undergo investigations. You have to be grilled not only by Senate investigators, but by House investigators as well. If there is anything that's coming out of this, it's an attempt made to, to dissuade people from giving money to Democrats because they know that Chairman Burton or his minions can come in and depose you. So I, I share Mr. Condit's good faith uh, attempt here. Um, I probably am is not as kind as him because I think that this is not just about saving taxpayers' dollars. I think that's what Mr. Condit's trying to do. But I frankly think what's going on here is an attempt being made to change the political process in this country, um, to discourage people from giving to Democrats, knowing that this all-powerful committee is going to come in and take your deposition to find out why you gave money. But this attempt, and again, to get back on to Mr. Condit's point, because he tries to do things in a bipartisan basis, and I don't want to poison the well for him, look at it. it. It saves money. This saves money for the taxpayer. Um, and I don't see how, how we could be opposed to that. If Senator Thompson says there's a problem, if there's executive session problems, it won't kick in. But if there's no problem, I don't think it's a sin to save money. Now, yield back the balance of my time. Mr. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, the Mr. chair now takes his five minutes. Is that all right, Mr. Wax? First of all, I think it's a great idea, and Mr. Condit is to be applauded for trying to figure out a way to work with the Senate and to save the taxpayers money. Uh, we will be meeting with Senator Thompson and his staff, and hopefully with the minority staff and the minority leader Mr. Glenn over there uh, as well as uh, with uh, Mr. Waxman uh, but we have a couple of problems that need to be addressed regarding this kind of a process first of all uh, as Mr. Haster said deposition uh, to be depositions to be shared are executive uh, executive session material and there's a problem there with the rules that the the protocol that we passed and the protocol that the Senate passed both would have to be changed in order to, facil to facilitate what you're talking about. And this uh, also would require a committee vote on every single deposition, whether the ranking member agrees with it or not, because you're working with the other, other body. So there's some real hurdles that would have to uh, be overcome. Uh, I will broach the subject with uh, Senator Thompson. Uh, I, I doubt if it can be changed without a change of the protocols of both houses and votes on every single deposition, which we've already you know, voted on just previously. So, uh, uh, although it sounds like a great idea, and I, and I think it's it's uh, the gentleman's heart's in the right place. I, I'm not sure it's something that can be uh, worked out, but we will look into it. And with that, I uh, yield back the balance of my time. Does anyone else seek time? Yeah. Gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased with your openness to this idea. What Mr. Condit has expressed to this committee over and over again is we ought not to be wasting taxpayers' money on duplicative investigations. Uh, and he suggested we not have one uh, in the House, another one in the Senate, all doing exactly the same thing. Uh, we're not suggesting that in this amendment, but this amendment does set up a process so that we don't uh, duplicate, dupli duplicate the uh, depositions. And it's important not to duplicate it, be, not only because we're wasting staff time, taxpayers' money, but think about the impact on, an in, on a witness who has to come in with his lawyer and sit through a deposition for hours, maybe days, in the House, and then go and do the same deposition and pay for it all over again, both in time and money, in a Senate uh, proceeding. So I would hope uh, we could adopt this amendment, or if not, this precise amendment, these, the, the, uh, the, the uh, basis for this amendment, so that uh, if we need to change the protocols, let's change the protocols. And I would hope if you, if we, you get a meeting together with uh, Senator Thompson and uh, Glenn and myself, that we set up a way so that we don't have this duplication, this waste of money, this intrusion on people's privacy and, uh, uh, and personal time for no purpose whatsoever. I think this is a good amendment. I'm, I'm ready to support it now. Uh, if, if the gentleman from California wants to urge that we vote for it now, 
Uh, and if we need to then, after consultations with Senator Thompson, make changes in this amendment or in protocols to make it work, that, that, that's with, fine. With the, with the ranking minority member, just sure. yield for me briefly. Sure. If the gentleman with, would, would, would uh, choose to withdraw his amendment right now, I can assure him that we will uh, broach the subject with uh, Senator Thompson uh, to see if there is some way that uh, we can coordinate better and, 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 and work with them so that we don't duplicate our efforts. Uh, but if he, if he doesn't, I think uh, we should vote the amendment down today. I, I yield. Uh, it's my time. I yield to right. Mr. Condit. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, uh, we had uh, a hearing uh, in July, and I asked you the question in July, and I, and I have a great deal of respect for you, and, and I know that uh, you're working to try to do the right thing. But you, in July, told me that you're gonna, you were going to approach the Senate then. You're going to talk to Senator Thompson about what well, we could uh, change the process so that we could avoid duplication if possible. Here we are, um, you know, several months later, and we haven't done that. I, I'm just shocked and surprised that we haven't had a discussion with the Senate about trying to come up with some themes and some rules and some regulations on how we avoid that. I mean, today. And we're adopting the rules today to proceed ahead with the hearings, and no one's contacted the Senate on how we avoid duplication. If, if, if the gentleman from California would yield so I can answer the gentleman. Yes, I yield. Yes, I yield. I'll yield back. Uh, uh, our staffs have been meeting to try to figure out ways to coordinate to uh, conserve time and energy for the people who are coming in to be deposed. Uh, and uh, uh, we tried to work out if they're going to bring somebody in that we want to depose and vice versa that uh, we schedule our, our depositions uh, uh, at the same time or very close to the same time so that there's no, no need for duplicative trips. Uh, and we worked on some other things as well. I have not shared that information with the gentleman from California. Uh, I apologize for that, but I'll be glad to have our staff brief you on what we have come up well, with. Well, let me reclaim my time. It's an interesting statement. Our staffs have been working together, but you haven't briefed us yet. We've already issued 73 subpoenas to parties that the Senate has also subpoenaed. So let's, let's, let's get real. Let's be fair about this whole thing. I think we ought to adopt this amendment now because I think the, Mr. Condon is right. We've had plenty of time to figure out how to coordinate these two uh, investigations. And uh, if we haven't done it by now without forcing it through an amendment, I, I just don't see it's going to get if done. If the gentleman would yield. Yes. We have issued no subpoenas yet for depositions, not one. And that's what we're talking about. Well, subpoenas, 73 subpoenas have been issued to parties, maybe for documents. For documents. Which means that those parties had to produce documents twice. Maybe if they asked for things a little differently, they might have had to get other documents. Certainly for subpoenas for the individuals, uh, if they haven't been issued, they're going to be issued. And that's the purpose to have this amendment so that they aren't duplicated. Yeah. Gentlemen, time has expired. Mr. Satter. First, I want to <clears throat> thank the chairman for showing a uh, willingness to avoid duplication, and I think Mr. Condit's made a, uh, a good point that we don't want the same questions asked twice when it can be avoided, and I think you've pointed out some of the rules that would make it um, a di difficult, but hopefully possible. But there are a couple other key things here, and that is, is that just because the same person is being interviewed twice does not mean that everything that they cover is duplicative. It does not mean that we won't be pursuing different things at different times. Uh, we may have a, a later interview or the Senate may have a later interview. We may be uh, investigating something different. I think it's wise when possible and if the rules can be such that if whichever side has a deposition first, the other side looks at it so you can see what's already been covered, but that may lead to additional questions. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't ever interview a person twice. The scope of their hearings are substantially different than the scope of our hearings. And while I think Mr. Condit's general point Mr. Condit's general point was good, and I think you're trying to address that, and I encourage you to continue to work with the Senate to try to do so. I think other members are of trying to keep from going ahead uh, with certain depositions, and it's just another a tactic, it sounds to me, to slow down the process, because I think you've already shown a willingness to the basic point that Mr. Condit's doing, and I would encourage you to continue to work with him to do that. And this, you know, I don't think there's anybody here that thinks the same question should be asked twice or three times if it can be avoided. But that doesn't mean that our attorneys and their attorneys and our members and their members can ask the same questions or even that we're investigating the same point just because the same person is being deposed. With that, I, do that. I thank the gentleman.
The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, um, first of all, I want to uh, say uh, that I support Mr. Condon's amendment. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm listening to all this. And if I were a citizen in, the, in, the, in this United States, I'd be disgusted. It's so sad that we people who ran just a few months ago telling the American people that we are leaders, telling them that we will stand up for their rights, telling them that we will lift their lives up to make them the best that they can be. We sit here that we can't even talk to them, which is right across the hall, give a break. The fact is that we can say over and over again what we can't do. American people want to know what we can do. Mr. Cunningham is uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for. And I agree with Mr. Barrett that um, he bent over, was talking about Condon, to try to do things in a bipartisan way. And I applaud him for that. I really do. But I think one of the things, we listen to what's going on here today. There's basic mistrust between both sides. That's what it's all about. Mr. Condon says that he bring it up a few months ago, and he did. We were told that there would be this interaction and there would be efforts to to not duplicate the process. I'm sure he's gotten to a point of frustration. I don't think he likes just making these proposals. But he wants he represents a group of people just like all of us do. People who merely want government and I'll say it over and over again. I don't care whether they're Republican or Democrat. I'm telling you, people who are looking at this right now, they want two things. They want government to be cost efficient and effective. I don't care who they are. In some kind of way, I think if I were just somebody sitting out there looking at this, I would begin to wonder what is going on in the Congress of the United States of America. This is America. This is a can-do nation. And we are a can-do House and a can-do Senate. And so all this stuff about backdoor, it's not about backdoor, it's a question of respect. You got people, I've conducted hundreds of, of depositions. Hundreds. And I can tell you that depositions are very costly and people go through a lot of trauma in dealing with them. And I stop and I pause this afternoon, the four or five hours that we've been here, ask us all to pause for a moment and put a face on the policy. Put a face on the policy. To so just regular folks. Somebody a little bit earlier in one of the former investigations, they had 270 deposed 270 people. Ten of them were actually brought before the committee. That's a whole, that's a big difference. But yet and still, they had to sit through a process. This is a way to bring all of this together. I think that the Senate has acted very, very responsibly. I read a little bit earlier from Common Cause and from uh, another group that are concerned about what we're doing. They've already basically declared what we're doing as almost a fraud. So the question that comes is if that's what Common Cause is saying, and if that's what the League of Women Voters are saying, then why can't we take steps to make a difference? And to you, Mr. Chairman, I, I really appreciate what you said about talking to the tenant. But the question becomes very simple. If we want to establish this trust that I'm talking about, the question is, I think that Mr. Condon, and I do consider him to be a reasonable person, is that he needs to know some timetables. He needs to understand that, you know, we're going to do this within the next week or whenever we're going to do it. I mean, I, if I were him, I wouldn't mind backing off of it as long as I knew that something was going to happen. I can't speak for him, but I'll tell you one thing. If I asked for something months ago and I don't see it happening, then I can't have that kind of trust, and that is the problem to the American people, as you listen to this, and you hear this, I just want to apologize to you because I came to Congress with a commitment to lift you up and to make your life better, not to spend your money, and not to address things in a way that we are not cost effective and inefficient. And so I, uh, I, I would yield back the balance of my time. Uh, I yield time, I yield time to the gentleman from California. The gentleman from California is recognized for the remainder I, I, of the gentleman. I, I appreciate the comments that were just made, and, and I, I didn't respond to Mr. Barrett. Uh, 
um, and, and I do want to talk about it just for a moment, and that is that I want this amendment to try to save taxpayers a little bit of money, and, and that is true. I, I have done that, and, and I think we all should try to do that, and, and I think the points about it sounds that we can't work with the people down the other end of this building is, is pretty accurate. But also, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out not only do we save the taxpayers' money, but there is a human side of this. I've sat through several investigative hearings since I've been here and watched the wear and tear on people that sat before us. And I think that if we could do something to be accommodating, we reduce the wear and tear of the time and financial burden on them because they're all not guilty when they come in here. But when they leave here, they leave here with a bad taste in their mouth. And I think that we ought to do everything we can to factor in the human element of this to try to avoid duplication and try to do what we can to save money on their behalf as well. Not only money for this committee, money for the taxpayers, but also their money. Try to reduce the cost to them. So um, I don't intend to, to work on the minute because I have not heard uh, an alternative, a, a concrete alternative about how we proceed in working with the Senate and trying to avoid duplication. So with that, I yield back to the gentleman from Maryland. Is there any, uh, any further discussion of the amendment? The, checking, the gentleman is recognized. Thank you very much. Um, you know, listening to the discussion reminds me of my mother who used to tell my brother and I that we would argue with a signboard. Uh, Mr. Cundit has actually given us a signboard. I mean, it is clear there is no argument. There's nothing to look at. There is nothing to do if you want to save taxpayers' money. It would be very difficult for someone to convince me that they are interested in saving taxpayers' money and vote against this amendment. And surely there might be people who will vote against it. But please don't ever tell me that you're trying to save taxpayers' money. Chairman yields back to the time. Mr. Barr? From Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I suppose that if this amendment were offered in a, in a perfect world, uh, in a perfectly efficient uh, Congress, uh, with birds chirping in the background and, and the sun shining brightly, uh, it might make some sense. Unfortunately, Mr. Chairman, we don't live in such a world. The procedures under which the Senate operates are quite different from those under which the House operates. Uh, if members on the other side don't realize that, I'm sure that we could have a copy of the Senate rules brought over, uh, perhaps also copies of newspaper articles that have been uh, out there uh, recently uh, detailing the frustrations that members on the Senate side have because the rules uh, thwart moving forward expeditiously on virtually any matter on which the senator who chairs their committee wants to proceed. Now, it may be that some on this side would like to operate under uh, similar procedures. Uh, I don't think so, uh, and if that's what they would like, I can certainly propose rules to adopt the Senate rules uh, over on this side. The fact is, Mr. Chairman, that this amendment and what we are about here uh, is about getting at the truth. Uh, this amendment does not further that, uh, that goal. If there is, for example, Mr. Chairman, information that comes to the attention of this committee, as we see from some of the charts here already, has come to our attention that witnesses uh, are fleeing, attempting to flee. Uh, indeed, just in the hours that we have been debating these matters here today, uh, this had been uh, a procedure under which uh, uh, the incumbents of the other side would be required. And we were sitting here uh, five hours later. Uh, that certainly would have afforded uh, quite a bit of time for somebody to flee the jurisdiction of this uh, Requiring us then, we receive information that is relevant to the search for the truth, uh, which is our goal, or at least ought to be our goal, which it certainly is on this side. And just perchance, perhaps, uh, which, uh, on which we have information that is very relevant and very timely uh, has already been uh, for the Senate committee or has already been proposed, then this amendment could be used uh, to delay the process of bringing that person before us, perhaps uh, allowing them time 
uh, to flee the jurisdiction. What this committee does may very well jive with what the Senate does. In particular instances, however, it may not. Uh, we cannot bind the Senate any more than the Senate can bind us to conduct an investigation in a certain way or with a certain uh, goal in mind. Uh, and talking uh, about uh, saving the taxpayers' money is all fine and good, and putting a nice title on an amendment uh, such as we've done uh, is very clever. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, Mr. Chairman, uh, this committee uh, and all of us on here, at least myself, have an obligation pursuant to representing my constituents to operate within the bounds of the rules to the, of the body to which I was elected. And my constituents uh, want to get at the truth. When our serious allegations are raised, as they have been uh, in these instances here, then they want us to get at the bottom of it. Uh, and if that means subpoenaing witnesses under fair but firm requirements and procedure, procedures that allow us to move forward, uh, then at least my constituents are willing to uh, expend some of their hard-earned monies uh, to carry out uh, that, the search for the truth in such a way. But uh, uh, this, uh, this amendment uh, is very similar to other things that we've seen people do recently uh, where there's a problem and they wish not to confront it. Uh, to come up with uh, another study, another commission, another series of deliberations. That doesn't save time, that takes time. And time is very precious. So far from this being a piece of legislation that would protect the taxpayer somehow or avoid duplication, I'm afraid that it could very well be used, not being the intent of it, but it could be used to further delay proceedings uh, with the results, uh, as we've already seen in some instances, that uh, individuals uh, to be accountable to the citizens of this country to flee the jurisdiction, and I would not want us to be a party uh, to such efforts, inadvertent as it may be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back to balance this time. Is there further discussion on the amendment? The gentleman from California. I will not take five minutes. I just want to react to a few items which have been raised recently. Uh, let me assure the gentleman from Georgia that no one on this side of the aisle has facilitated the fleeing of the jurisdiction of the United States. And I think it's sort of intriguing to have these phantoms brought before us when we are dealing with a common sense, cost effective, compassionate amendment that would not delay, but facilitate the work of the committee and would save the American taxpayers money. So I think it would be useful if we could refocus the debate on the issue. We do not wish to engage in unnecessary costly duplication. Uh, the question of fleeing the country is an intriguing question, but it is about as relevant to this discussion as is uh, the performance of the, of the Kirov Ballet. Uh, it has nothing to do with what we are dealing with. Uh, I want to commend my friend from California for offering a common sense, cost effective, compassionate amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Is there further discussion? If there's no further discussion, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman. California, all those in favor will, fig will signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed will signify by saying no. No. Opinion chair, the noes have it. The noes have it. A roll call has been requested and will be granted. The call the roll. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton votes no. Mr. Gilman? No. Mr. Gilman votes no. Mr. Hastert? Ms. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Chase? Mr. Chase votes no. Mr. Chiff? Mr. Cox? Ms. Ross Layton? No. Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Horn? Mr. Micah? Uh, 
Mr. Branca votes no. Mr. Davis from Virginia? No. Mr. Davis from Virginia votes no. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Scar? Mr. Chaddock? Mr. LaTourette? Mr. LaTourette votes no. Mr. Stanford? No. Mr. Stanford votes no. Mr. Sinu? No. Mr. Sinu votes no. Mr. Sessions? No. Mr. Patrick votes no. Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Snowbarger votes no. Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Portman? No. Mr. Portman votes no. Mr. Waxman? Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lantos? Aye. Mr. Lantos votes aye. Mr. Wise? Aye. Mr. Wise votes aye. Mr. Owens? Aye. Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes aye. Mr. Kanjorski? Mr. Condit? Mr. Condit votes aye. Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes aye. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes yes. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes yes. Mr. Bogoyevich? Yes. Mr. Bogoyevich votes yes. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Yes. Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Yes. Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. Allen? Yes. Mr. Allen votes aye. Mr. Ford? Yes. Mr. Ford votes aye. Mr. Hasser? Yes. Mr. Hasser votes no. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes no. Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Horn votes no. Mr. McIntosh? No. Mr. McIntosh votes no. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? No. Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. Sessions? Mr. Kanjaki? Mrs. Maloney, Mr. Fatal, Mr. Turner. Yeah. Clerk will report the vote. Mr. Turner, there are 16 ayes and 21 nays. Fails. Are there further amendments? Clerk will report the amendment. Fairness amendment rounds of questioning. On page two and line five, after questions and start, but not more but but not more than one hour. The gentleman is recognized for five minutes to discuss his amendment. The amendment is very straightforward. We have a hearing today. Um, and probably some members will feel that they didn't come out with the result that they wanted, but I, I frankly think that each member here has had the opportunity um, to engage in a, in a true debate. Likewise, our committee structure in Congress works well because when we have witnesses before this committee or other witnesses, there's a fairness to the, to the committee structure. And each member of Congress is allowed to ask the witness question increments. This has worked very well, and I think it's it, it worked very well. I have a serious problem with the rules as proposed as pertain to the position. Let me anchor myself firmly in this and just take a minute to read what the deposition rules are. Questions in the deposition will be propounded in rounds. A round shall include as much time as necessary to ask all pending questions. In each round, 
a member of the committee staff attorney designated by the chairman shall ask questions first, and the member or committee staff attorney designated by the ranking minority member shall ask questions second. The practical impact of this amendment is that I, as a member of the Democratic Party, or other member of the Democratic Party, will not be able to ask any questions whatsoever until a Republican member or a Republican staff member decides that we should be permitted to ask a question. So members, Democratic members of Congress could be forced to wait literally hours, if not days, before they're permitted to ask any questions at all in a deposition. Any questions at all. I could be required to sit there for three days while a Republican staff person goes through as many questions as he or she wants. I've got nothing against Republican staff people. It's an element of fairness that is totally, totally lacking in the proposal that's put forth by, by the majority party. What is my solution? My solution is to simply have last for more than one hour. The Republican member or the designee of the Republican can ask questions for an hour. Democratic member or the designee of the Democratic side can ask questions for another hour. And you would go back for a second round of questions by the Republican side, a second hour of questioning by the Democratic side. You would have fairness, and each side would be able to ask questions of the witnesses, exactly like we have in congressional hearings here on Capitol Hill. The only difference, of course, is recognizing the investigative nature of this is to allow the rounds of questioning to last longer than five minutes. I think that this is a very fair amendment. It takes nothing away from the majority. It simply tries to put Democratic members of Congress on the same plane as staff members for Republican members. And I don't think that that's too much to ask. So I would ask my colleagues to take a look at the amendment. It's a very short amendment. It simply states that the rounds will last no longer than one hour, and you can have numerous rounds. We are not in any way attempting to cut short the length of the deposition. We are simply trying to make sure that it is fair questioning like we have here on Capitol Hill. And I would yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, yield. I would yield to Mr. Towns. Let me commend the gentleman. I think it's an excellent um, amendment because even when the police is getting, uh, that a person gets stop and say, let me talk to uh, uh, my lawyer, and uh, of course, a break. But this to me also could lead to browbeating. And you know, about people that in many instances are not, have not done anything, just have some information that we need. And I think that this is a very fair amendment. I think it's one that we should take very seriously because, you know, while we don't want to be guilty of just sort of bringing people in here and abusing them, the other part which I think that uh, very important uh, to me, and of course I'm certain to many others here, and I have nothing against staff, and uh, I have a few of them myself. Uh, but I think that for a member to have to sit and wait hours and day, even a staff member who has not been a candidate or anything and has not gotten one vote, to sit there and wait for them to go two or three days is just not fair. And I think that, uh, uh, we, uh, that, I think that uh, uh, we need to take in, in consideration because if we were voted on, people sent us here, they expect us to do a job. And for us to uh, why somebody that did not get any votes, you know, or dictate the process in terms of when we can talk, so I think that is unfair. So I would like to commend the gentleman for an excellent uh, uh, amendment. And I'm on the other side of the that, uh, everybody would look at this as, uh, as a fairness amendment and be supportive of it. So I uh, thank the gentleman for yielding. Would the gentleman yield to me, please? It's, it's not my time. Uh, would the gentleman... Let, let me just say that while I oppose the amendment, I can assure the minority as well as the majority members of the committee that no member who wants to come in and ask questions during a deposition will be uh, asked to wait while the deposition continues and the staff conducts the deposition. I will instruct the staff, and I'm doing so right now, that in the event we have a deposition and a member comes in, deference is to be given to the member and the member, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, I will be able to ask questions immediately. Blanche in the streetcar named Desire. I do not rely on the kindness of strangers or whatever her statement. Well, I'm not a stranger. I'm a stranger. And you have my staff members are, Mr. Chairman. I don't know who those staff members are. And my name is 
My is, name isn't Blanche. <laughs> there's nothing that's going to, if you think it's a good idea, Mr. Chairman, make it the rule. Chairman? Chairman? His time has expired, Mr. Cox. I thank the Chairman, uh, and I appreciate the uh, discussion thus far on both sides. Uh, the, but I must observe that um, this is the very same provision that was included in the first amendment that has already been voted on. Uh, for that reason, we might call this the tooth and nail. Because it suggests that uh, everything that we do in this committee is going to be objected to and fought tooth and nail, no matter how reasonable. The procedure in the positions that is proposed in these rules is precisely the same procedure that exists under the federal rules of civil procedure. For all depositions taken in any lawsuit uh, in federal court in the United States of America, it's exactly the same as is included in the codes of civil procedure in every state in the union. And so arguments that it is an unfair procedure uh, must be uh, thus uh, convincing on the point that uh, the civil justice system in America is abusive leads to browbeating or the other things that have been suggested. Uh, to the contrary, uh, the procedure couldn't be more simple. It is that uh, there will be questions not artificially limited uh, in length by questions not artificially limited in length. Uh, both the majority and the minority are the same of not being arbitrarily limited uh, in pursuing a line of question. It's very important that everyone is a deposition, when one is conducting a deposition, rather than a, a debate on the floor of the House, where rules necessarily at the time, or even here in committee, uh, to, in order to get to the truth, in order to get to the bottom of, of an issue, in order to cover uh, a, a chain of custody for complicated uh, document situations and so on, uh, that you be able to label it, uh, establish uh, authenticity of documents and so on, and not be cut off uh, right in the middle of questioning. Uh, the way that a deposition is conducted in America, I should say, because it's the same in federal and state courts, is precisely this way. It is an eminently fair procedure, uh, and it is uh, the only procedure that I'm aware of for civil lawsuits uh, anywhere in the country. And so for that reason, uh, uh, while I do not think uh, that this is a, a difficult Legitimate question for a difficult yield. analysis, uh, and while I think it's already been voted on once uh, in this hour, uh, uh, we should once again uh, defeat the amendment. Yes, I yield to my colleague. The gentleman is forgetting a couple of things. Uh, number one, that in the process, you also have and you also can be disbarred. But the point is that um, that's in terms of lawsuits, also in state and federal court. Uh, here we don't have that. So there is a major difference. So the point I'm saying to you, put uh, in, me, uh, and I think the chairman made a very eloquent statement, and I think that if we put that in, in terms of supporting this uh, amendment, we put that in, because you know as well, the staff members come and they go. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, one might know about it, another one might not know about it, but if, if he supports it, it seems that it would be very easy for him to just indicate that, and let's move forward by adopting this amendment. And then it would be no question. We, then we would know that. And also, I think it points out, you know, where we are in this whole process. You know, right. 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 The one point that you made, sir, uh, all the amendment is addressed to is one hour. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's a question of uh, whether or not questions will be arbitrarily limited, not in some cases, but in all cases. Uh, second, with respect to staff attorneys that will be conducting these depositions, and it's important, important to point out that we are talking about staff attorneys, not staff. Uh, but staff attorneys. Uh, these are highly qualified people who are trained investigators. Uh, they have been on the side and the majority side uh, from our U.S. attorney's offices around the country. Uh, in almost all cases, they will be more skilled questioners even than ourselves. Uh, and for that reason, I don't think we should denigrate their contribution to uh, fact-finding expedition that uh, we set out on here. We to the bottom of this uh, as quickly as possible and as possible and as normally as possible and the rule that's being proposed is the identical rule as I say. 
federal rules of civil procedure and in the codes of procedure in all 50 states in America. It is the quintessential, normal, typical, correct procedure to follow. Uh, well, the gentleman yield. And when it comes to uh, members of Congress participating in this, uh, I take the chairman uh, uh, at his word. Uh, I think it is uh, a useful courtesy to be extended to members, uh, uh, not that we will limit to one hour arbitrarily, as this amendment would require questioning in all cases, uh, uh, but rather when a member shows up to let that member questions, and uh, if that procedure that we're following, I think, will be much better advised. And so the gentleman I, yields. Please yield. So just to make sure that we're on the same wavelength here, this amendment, as I'm sure you understand, does not limit the deposition to one does not limit it to one round. No, of course, it, it uh, arbitrarily limits the round of questioning to one hour. And there can and be interrupts it uh, right in the middle. There can uh, no be many, many rounds. On. There can be many rounds. You would agree with that. Uh, but the gentleman would also acknowledge that the minority's right to ask questions is arbitrarily limited. It can go on for as long as you wish it to go on. No, that's not correct. Each, that is not correct. Each side would have, uh, each round would be one hour. No, I majority uh, and the minority. Understands me reclaiming my time. What I'm stating is that under this rule, the one that we're uh, voting on, not the amendment, but the rule itself, the minority side and the majority side get an unlimited opportunity to ask questions without the arbitrary limit of one that this amendment would impose. That's a fair procedure. I think it's a better procedure. Back. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Gentleman's time has uh, Gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. I want to speak in favor of this amendment, and it is amazing to me the lengths the gentleman from California, Mr. Cox, is going to to argue against this very simple, fair amendment. It's a tribute to his skill as a lawyer to contort an argument that the only way we should do this is what is done in the courts, because that's the precedent for us to follow. We have a precedent to follow. We have the precedent for the rules of this committee. And the only time this committee ever took deposition, and those were the rules offered by Chairman Clear and voted for by the member from California, Mr. Cox, the Chairman, Mr. Burton, all the members of this committee on both sides of the aisle last last year. Not yet, not yet, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. The Klinger rule said that before you can issue subpoenas for depositions, you have concurrence and so on and so forth. And, and you have to have one hour each. Well, the debate we just had was whether we're going to issue support with concurrence, even though that's the precedent. Republicans ran over it. No, you're not going to have what is always the protection of the minority to uh, have a say on subpoenas before they're issued. Okay, we lost it. Now the minority is simply asking that we keep the rule the Republicans had in the last Congress that said when you're in a deposition, Skilled staff lawyers or skilled Republican members can go for one hour asking a question, and then the skilled staff lawyers or members of the Democratic side could ask questions for an hour, and then you go back. You have rounds. There's no committee in Congress that ever says Republicans have as much as they want to ask questions of witnesses, and when they've exhausted the rounds, we can have as much time as we want. That's absurd. It should be fair. Each side gets a turn, then the other side gets a turn. Full amount, an hour, an hour. It used to be in committee hearings, it was five minutes on each side. We changed the rules to, change it to, to have a half hour on each side so we can develop the case. An hour is enough for each side to have before the other side gets its turn. The chairman said, trust me. Trust me. If you come in and want to ask questions of witnesses, and my staff is asking questions, they're going to let you ask your questions because that's a courteous thing to do, or they're going to answer to me. Now, wait a second. Why should we have to trust you, Mr. Chairman? That's the way you've conducted this whole investigation. We trust you. We should trust you to be fair. We have seen no evidence of any fairness whatsoever. Any point in this whole proceeding of this investigation, we have never been given an ounce of fairness. The rules, the precedents, swept away. Subpoenas issued on, against Democrats, hundreds, against Republicans, tens. No fairness. We have an experience of unfairness to this point, and all we're asking for is an opportunity to have a round after an hour on your side, an hour on our side, 
Well, vote us down. Take your Republican majority and vote us down. Don't let us even have that opportunity to be in a, in a situation where the rules are not only fair, but they're the Republican rules in the last Congress. Go, vote us down. And then tell the American people, you've got a bipartisan fair investigation. Because none of us believe it. Who wants me to yield? Gentleman uh, from Wisconsin, I'll yield to you. And I, and I appreciate your comments, Mr. Mr. Waxman. And I have to stress where this amendment came from. This amendment came from the rule of the Committee on Government Reform and Oversight House of Representatives, House of Representatives March 1996. The identical language from this committee from last session. Because there was an attempt that was being made that time to be fair. To recognize that fairness actually counts for something here on Capitol Hill. I know that that may seem bizarre at this point, but there was at least an attempt under Mr. Klinger to have some fairness in depositions. Mr. Cox refers to depositions in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. The federal Rules of Civil Procedure are great for civil actions in federal court. This is not a civil action in federal court. This is a congressional investigative hearing. And just as every committee on the House side of Capitol Hill has questioning that's done in, in alternating rounds between the Democrats and the Republicans. And just as Mr. Klinger and the Republican members of this committee last session recognized that there was an element of fairness that should be included in this, that's what this amendment does. It's, it's a very straightforward. Jim is absolutely correct. Congressman Morella, Congressman Shays, Congressman Cox, Congressman Haster, you were all here in the last Congress and you voted for this very amendment. It was the Klinger Amendment. Why should our staff have to show up at a deposition at 9 o'clock in the morning and wait till 4 or 5 in the afternoon before they can ask any questions? Why should our members have to be subjected to that? We ask you to vote for this amendment because it's fair and it's also the president of this committee and it was Republican chairman of this committee, and I've heard no reason to vote against it by Mr. Cox that the, sent, that the rules of procedure in courts, in depositions, may be different. Well, the precedent for the Congress and this committee is to get rounds equally divided. I, and I will ask you to think about how you'd feel if you were in the minority, and I don't want Mr. Micah to tell me how agreed you all were when you were in the minority. That's never an explanation to do something back because there's no end to it. If you want to just punish us because we're in the minority, go ahead and punish us, but don't come and claim you've got a fair committee. I ask for a roll call vote on this, and I want to see who votes against it. Uh, Mr. Hastert, is there a discussion on the amendment? Mr. Hastert. Just very briefly. Uh, yeah, I have been associated with the gentleman from California for a number of years, and I've always appreciated his ability to express himself. And he does a very good job when he expresses his own outrage. But let me come back, and I think we we'll step back a minute and look at a common sense approach. Now, by the rules, the rounds alternate Democrat, Republican, vice versa, but they alternate one to the other. If you're pursuing a line of questioning, and I'm not an attorney, but if you are pursuing a line of questioning and you want to move through that whole invoice of issues, develop the line of thought, develop the arguments, and have the person being deposed be able to answer that while he's thinking in that line of argument, even in his own defense. That seems to me common sense. And for the fact that if somebody, I don't know how long the deposition may last, it may last you know, an hour, it may last 25 minutes, it may last two hours, or it may last three hours. But when the person of the next party gets to run his deposition too. And so uh, it would seem rather than waiting an hour, doing your deposition, for an hour, and then waiting another hour, and then doing your deposition for an hour, and then waiting another hour, and then doing your deposition for an hour, and then waiting another hour, it depends on how long, uh, you're doubling the time that it's going to take you to depose somebody. Let me just finish my thought, if I, if I could. And, you know, to me, it seemed a common sense thing to do. 
ask your questions, get them done with, move on. And then let the person who is doing posing from the other party to complete his uh, period of time and his thought process and to get the question um, that he wants to pursue. And in fairness to the person being deposed, let him answer, ask, answer the questions while his thought is in the line of questioning. And um, I, again, I said I, I, I have great admiration for the gentleman from California. He's very articulate. He does a very good job. We will do him second too. But especially when he has outrage, he does a good job of explaining that. But I think what we need to do in this whole issue is to step back, look at what the common sense approach is, and for the person opposed. I think the rules here are eminently fair, both sides, and the person being opposed. I would be happy to yield uh, to the gentleman from California. Thank you for yielding. And we have had a long discussion, and I have the highest regard for the gentleman, and I understand that sometimes you have to make an argument. Uh, but what bothers me is that there were 80 depositions taken last Congress under these very rules. I have never heard any complaint of any problem. It seems to be a basic fairness to let one side turn and to have one side, just because it happens to be the minority side, have to wait more than an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. So I just don't see why we need to change the rules under which we've operated at the same time we've had deposition authority. And I think I'm going to make an argument against it. For the 16 years that I've been involved in government, I had another life. I was a coach, taught high school, coached, and uh, certainly not as dignified as being an attorney or all the prosecutors which we have across this. I was just a humble coach. But one time there was an argument about who got to use it. So the principal, who was never involved in coaching, said, that is, I'm going to let the wrestling team use it for an hour, and then the basketball team can use it for an hour, and then the wrestling team can use it for an hour, and then the basketball team can use it for an hour. It didn't work very well. It seems the same type of common sense may apply uh, to the same situation. And a humble explanation, I yield back my time. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. I don't think the gentleman's all that humble. Uh, further discussion? Not the amendment. The uh, ranking minority has asked for a roll call vote, therefore we will grant a roll call vote. Roll. Mr. Burton? No. Mr. Burton? Votes no. Mr. Hillman? Mr. Hastert? Mr. Hastert votes no. Mrs. Morella? Mrs. Morella votes no. Mr. Shays? Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Ross Layton? Ms. Ross Layton votes no. Mr. McHugh? Mr. McHugh votes no. Mr. Mr. Micah? Mr. Micah votes no. Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. McIntosh? Two sets of seconds. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes no. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? No. Mr. Shattuck votes no. Mr. LaTourette? No. Mr. LaTourette votes no. Mr. Stanford? No. Mr. Stanford votes no. Mr. Sununu? No. Mr. Sununu votes no. Mr. Sessions? Mr. Sessions votes no. Mr. Pappas? No. Mr. Pappas votes no. Mr. Snowbarger? No. Mr. Snowbarger votes no. <coughs> Mr. Barr? No. Mr. Barr votes no. Mr. Portman? No. Mr. Portman votes no. Mr. Waxman? Aye. Mr. Waxman votes aye. Mr. Lance votes Mr. Lance votes aye. Mr. Wise? Aye. Mr. Wise votes aye. Mr. Owens? Mr. Owens votes aye. Mr. Towns? Aye. Mr. 
Towns votes aye. Mr. Kandorski? Mr. Kandorski votes aye. Mr. Condit? Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders votes aye. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes aye. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes aye. Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes yes. Mr. Kucinich votes yes. Mr. Bogloyevich? Yes. Mr. Bogloyevich votes yes. Mr. Davis of Illinois? Mr. Davis of Illinois votes aye. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes aye. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes aye. Mr. Allen? Board votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Mr. Shays? Mr. Shays votes no. Mr. Shep? Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes no. Mr. Horn? No. Mr. Davis of Virginia? No. Mr. Davis of Virginia votes no. Mr. McIntosh? No. Mr. McIntosh votes no. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Condent? Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes yes. Mr. Chairman, for 21 days and 17 hours. Amendment failed. Uh, are there amendments? I'm sorry. What, what, would, would, would you repeat the vote? I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Clerk will report the tally again. Mr. Chairman, there are 17 ayes and 21 nays. 21 nays. Uh, we have two technical amendments, uh, one offered by uh, Mr. Waxman and one offered by myself. Uh, both sides have agreed to them. I ask you again, that they be considered as read without objection. On the amendments in lock, all those in favor will signify by saying aye. Those opposed, no. The amendments are adopted. Technical amendments are adopted. If there are no further amendments, if there are no further amendments, the question is on the adoption of the amendment in the nature of a substitute as amended, proposed by proposed rules 21. Yes. Just so I can have it on the record, the technical amendments do two things. First, it clarifies that the committee. The chairman or his designee will be the final judge of any relevancy objection. Before a witness can be cited by the committee for contempt, the committee must have an opportunity to determine by vote that the relevant objection should be sustained or overruled. If the committee determines that the objection be, should be overruled, the witness must be given an opportunity to comply with the determination before the witness can be cited for contempt. It also clarifies that the minority will get copies of the position transcripts at the same time. I just wanted to give my statement in the record about those amendments. The, the gentleman is referring to Clause 2K8 of House Rule 11. We will comply with that. Uh, from uh, New York. Mr. Chairman, I regret that I have another when the last roll call taken had I been present. I would have voted uh, no. The, if there are no further amendments, the question is on the, the amendment in the nature of a substitute to Rules 20 and 21 as amended. 
All those in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed signify by saying no. Any chair, the ayes have it. And the amendment, the nature of a substitute, has been adopted. The question now comes on proposed committee rule 20 and 21 as amended. All those in favor of the committee rules as amended signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed signify by saying no. No. Opinion chair, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A roll has been requested and will be granted. We'll call the roll. Mr. Burton? Aye. Mr. Burton votes aye. Mr. Gilman? Aye. Mr. Gilman votes aye. Mr. Hassert? Aye. Mr. Hassert votes aye. Mrs. Morella? Aye. Mrs. Morella votes aye. Mr. Chase? Mr. Chase votes aye. Mr. Schiff? Mr. Cox? Mr. Cox votes aye. Ms. Ross Layton? Ms. Ross Layton votes aye. Mr. McHugh? Mr. Horn? Mr. Horn votes aye. Mr. Micah? Mr. Davis of Virginia? Mr. Davis of Virginia votes aye. Mr. McIntosh? Mr. Souter? Mr. Barbara? Mr. Shattuck? Over votes, right? Mr. LaTourette votes aye. Mr. Sanford? Mr. Sanford votes aye. Mr. Sununu? Mr. Sununu votes aye. Mr. Sessions? Aye. Mr. Sessions votes aye. Mr. Pappas? Aye. Mr. Pappas votes aye. Mr. Snowbarger? Aye. Mr. Snowbarger votes aye. Mr. Barr? Aye. Mr. Barr votes aye. Mr. Portman? Aye. Mr. Portman votes aye. Mr. Waxman? No, Mr. Lantos? No. Mr. Lantos votes no. Mr. Wise? No. Mr. Wise votes no. Mr. Owens? No. Mr. Owens votes no. Mr. Towns? Mr. Towns votes no. Mr. Kantorski? Mr. Condon? Mr. Sanders? Mr. Sanders votes no. Mrs. Maloney? Mrs. Maloney votes no. Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett votes no. Ms. Norton? Ms. Norton votes no. Mr. Fatah? Mr. Cummings? Mr. Cummings votes no. Mr. Kucinich? Mr. Kucinich votes no. Mr. Bogoyevich? Mr. Bogoyevich? No. Mr. Davis of Illinois? No. Mr. Davis of Illinois? No. Mr. Tierney? Mr. Tierney votes no. Mr. Turner? Mr. Turner votes no. Mr. Allen? Mr. Ford? Mr. Ford votes no. Mr. Schiff? <laughs> Mr. McHugh? McIntosh votes yes. Mr. Souter? Mr. Souter votes aye. Mr. Scarborough? Mr. Shattuck? Aye. Mr. Shattuck votes aye. Mr. Kandorski? Mr. Kandorski votes no. Mr. Condit? Mr. Fatah? No, 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 no. Mr. Allen? The clerk will hold the 
you vote for just a moment. Clerk will hold a vote. We have uh, an agreement that Mr. is coming in his favor of voting Mr. Micah, so they're both on the record. I want everybody here. I want to well, if they're here. Get the language on the count. Doing joint trips, <laughs> but that doesn't mean you're joined at the hip when you're there. Votes aye. Mr. Mike recorded. Mr. Mike is not recorded. Mr. Mike votes aye and he's in breath. Is Mr. Condon here yet? Clerk will report. The clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, there are 22 ayes and 17 nays. The uh, amendment as amended is passed, and uh, we will send that to the Rules Committee before members leave. Uh, so we Those members that have to leave can leave. The, ch the chair will recess for about members who have to leave. Uh, there will be no more votes. Okay, let's The House voted to give government reform and Burton the right to subpoena witnesses. The Indiana Republican is investigating foreign campaign contributions to U.S. national campaigns and political parties. Later, the House will vote on whether to give China most favored nation trade status. The Senate will continue on its version of the although the vote is scheduled until next month. You can see the 